allegiance and call this meeting to order. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome Good morning, everybody. Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Okay, could I get approval of the county board minutes? So moved, Mr. Second. Chair. Got a motion by Commissioner Jelinski, seconded by uh, Commissioner Lemire. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? If there are none, can I get a motion to so approve moved. that? We've got a motion by Commissioner Wincher, seconded by? Second. Commissioner Lemire, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Great River Regional Library, good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning, Karen. Good morning. Thank you morning, for Karen. giving me some time on your agenda. It's great to see you all again. Um, I included in your packet just a real brief summary of the regional picture of our numbers last year at Great River. As you know, we're a six county system and last year was an exceptional year in terms of what it looked like in 32 different communities. <laughs> so it was a real challenge and at the same time the numbers don't look that different when you consider we were closed during our busiest month of the year in June. Um, we did have all of our locations up with curbside by that point and that's what helped uh, get some of our communities through COVID-19 last year. Um, we also saw a digital library take center stage, which was, you know, something that a lot of entities saw, but we are still seeing that growth continue. So we have about an 18% increase in our digital library usage last year. Our borrower numbers in the digital library also increased significantly, and that growth started right away when we closed our doors. We opened up our online registration process so that kids 13 and older could start registering from cards from home without coming into the building. And that was one of the factors that helped get us started. We were also fortunate in that the state opened up the a, a couple of grant opportunities for Great River to offer Wi-Fi to go. So in all five communities in Morrison County, we do have hot spots circulating from the library which is a, a huge um, relief for some communities. We had a pilot project back in Piers prior to that grant funding that had been uh, funded through fund development donations. And right when we closed, Grace gave a, our, our librarian out there, gave one of her, some of her borrowers a call and just said, hey, do you have Wi-Fi for your kids? Because you're going to distance learning. And she managed to check out all of the hotspots before we closed the doors. And one of those families would act, was actually letting another family use the hotspot. So that project has just reaped huge benefits, particularly out here where broadband's been really tough for people And if I may, Mr. Chair, Karen, I like interrupting. Could you sure. explain this uh, Wi-Fi hotspots? Again, I, am, I know the question, but just to give it a short Yeah, version. sure, I'm happy to, thanks. Yeah. It's, I sometimes slip into the library jargon world pretty quick. Um, we have hot spots at all um, of the locations. Little Falls, I think, has the most, but we have at least five hot spots at each library in Morrison County. So Piers, Royalton, Little Falls, Uppsala, and Swanville. And so patrons and can go there with their library card, check out that hot spot for one week, and then return it. They can get back on the list if they want the hot spot back. And we do have most of them circulating most of the time. There's a waiting list. Some of the smaller libraries, not as much. Um, part of that has to do with coverage, you know, if your cell phone doesn't work, your hotspot might not work quite as well either. But for the most part, that has been a really uh, growing service for us. And we're also looking at adding another vendor product so that, you know, right now we have T-Mobile hotspots. We're adding Verizon and a few communities just to make sure that that coverage works as best as it can. So um, we expect that project will expand in the next year because the state has expanded our definition of how we can use our telecommunications aid. So we will be able to do that um, long term because of the way the state has changed library funding for telecommunications. Uh, another service that really came into being last year is our print to go service. It was a new service we had added right before COVID started where people can actually from their phone 
print something at the library so you don't have to have a printer. And that really was a game changer even in the midst of COVID because a lot of people went home but they didn't necessarily have a printer. They might have had a phone. And so we were able to print a lot of um, different materials for people. And as recently as last week in Little Falls, there was a gentleman who desperately needed to print a Greyhound bus pass to get out to his family in West Virginia. It was kind of his last leg. Greyhound said, if it doesn't print, we're not giving you a refund. But Cindy and her staff were actually able to talk to his grandma and kind of work their way through the path, got the guy his bus pass, and he managed to get back to his family. So that digital connection in our physical libraries continues to be a lifeline for many people. And we're just really fortunate to have really strong staff and really strong support to offer those types of services. I mean, the books are a big part of what we do. Even um, we have about a quarter of our libraries in January and February that have higher circulation than they did the year before. And mind you, that's pre-COVID. So we are seeing an increase in activity even for the physical collection in some of our communities. And we expect as things reopen, we will continue to see growth in those activities from our communities. Typically, public libraries are busiest when the economy is in its worst state. And with a lot of people unemployed right now, I expect we will continue to see that growth. So I just wanted to thank Morrison County for your support. I wanted to thank Commissioner Wincher for being on the Great River Board. He helped us negotiate the ends of the St. Cloud Public Library lease last year. So we are now in really good shape with where our regional offices are located. And I also wanted to bring to your attention, um, because I know Morrison County pays attention to the state library stuff too, um, there is an active bill for state library funding once again. House File 1710, Senate File 1131 is the Regional Library Basic System Support Bill. That is the funding that provides 17% of Great River's operating dollars. It's a, our hope that we will be able to stabilize that formula to make our budgets more predictable. I saw you have uh, Senator Gazelka coming up on the agenda later. He and Commissioner Kircher and I and the director from Kichigami met with him a few weeks ago to just encourage him to help get that through the um, Senate. It did have a committee hearing last week. I'll be testifying with one of our other board members on Wednesday night with the House to try to get it through conference committee this time. It did make it to conference committee last time, but just ended up on the chopping block in the last minutes of the budget formation. So if you can put in a good word with the senator on Senate file 1131, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Um, and I'm happy to answer any other questions. I would have brought some staff here with me today, but we had a staff meeting, so um, that took precedent for their time today. But I, I appreciate your support. Sounds good. Thank you, Karen. Does anybody have any questions for Karen? I know our libraries are very important in all of our little cities and stuff, so thank you for all you do. Thank you. Yes. Okay, next we'll move on to the awards of excellence. Yes, Mr. Chair. I've got... Most of the group here. Um, but every year, as you know, we run an awards of excellence program in which we have and accept nominations for um, recognition of those staff that go above and beyond. You know, I don't think there's a doubt that um, anyone in this building doesn't work hard in the different things that we do and the very unique components of each different department. It's like running, you know, 13 different businesses under one roof and the fact that we make it go around well is, is a testament to what everyone does here. Um, but the winner, and Mr. Chair and I met, um, this year really is, is leadership and really is about getting folks through a year that no one could predict. Um, I was on a meeting call the other day with folks across the state and part of what the discussion was 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 that very thing that we as leaders are looked to support um, staff, look to support an organization through emotional turmoil, through ups and downs, through roller coaster of, of really caring for parents and kids that are out of school and back in school and, and dealing with our own personal situations, but then yet taking that on from our staff too and managing through that and continuing to do business and continuing to do it well. Um, and we did that and you guys did that. And so I'm grateful for that and I think the general public um, doesn't always understand what you bring to the table and how what you do makes this organization good and we, we weathered that storm well. Um, and so Mr. Chair if I could just read just that nomination. 
Too often leadership and local government is overlooked for their contribution to the organization and impact to the public. While every single person in every single position plays a significant part in the success, it's time to recognize the leadership team. The challenges presented this past year were significant, unimaginable in fact. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic started with an emergency meeting for this group on Sunday, March 8, 2020. With very little notice, I summoned all of you together and nearly everyone answered the call and came with a what, can we, what do we need to do attitude. Together we quickly developed a list of what needed to be done to support staff and ensure public needs were met. In the weeks and months to come, new challenges were tossed at this organization and you as leaders each was it tossed at the organization and you as leaders, each was met with hard work and dedication. Together, we figured out what to do when faced with situations we never thought possible. Each of you helped na staff navigate the emotions and stressors of living, working, parenting, and caring for others during a worldwide pandemic while dealing with all of that yourself as well. You quickly adapted to new rules, regulations, standards, and practices, navigating each as changes were made. Each of you had to get creative in service delivery. You forced yourselves and your staff to step out of comfort zones and try new ways of doing your work. You supported each other. You put in long hours. You worked hard and did what needed to be done. You led our organization successfully through the most tumultuous time in recent history. You've all proven you can adapt and overcome significant challenges, and because of that, this organization is coming out in the end better than it went in. For all of that and more, I am now and will forever be grateful, and I think Everyone, whether they recognize it or not, is grateful for what you all did to really lead and to really get this organization through on a daily basis. Every day we came in, we figured out what needed to be done. We adjusted when we couldn't. We adjusted when staff needed leaves or when they were on short notice, unable to respond. We adjusted when we had to close doors and we didn't want to. We adjusted when staff couldn't come in the building but in, and how to figure out how to bring them back in. We've, we've really been nimble and in government that isn't always the case and haven't we haven't had to prove ourselves to be nimble for well very often in the history um, of government and so it was I was very proud of what you all did for that and thank you and I think it's well deserved in terms of the award so Mr. Chair I'd like to move on this okay we got a motion by Commissioner Jelinski seconded by Second. Commissioner Wincher all in favor signify by saying aye aye is there any discussion on this not all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We just want to thank you very much, too. I have some certificates I was going to present to the group here if I could. <coughs> Do you want help? Be good. I got it. They're heavy, but I can grab it. Oh, that's Hamlin, the HR manager. Uh, Mr. Chair, is there going to be a photo up? And then afterward, we'll take a photo. Okay. I don't know. Yep, sounds good. We'll take a photo up when we're done. I might have just given you the wrong one because I still have yours in my hand, but I appreciate the fact 
I suppose I should have said it during the discussion hour, but uh, I do want to thank you. You know, this last year has been terrible with everything that's been going on, and uh, it seems like everybody managed their departments very well, and we got through all this, and we're probably continuing with this for a few more years yet, but uh, right now you've done a wonderful job, so thank you very much. Thank you all. Well, well, if we could take a picture with everybody, we yes. don't have a chance to all be together very often, so I thought we would do a photo. How do we want to do that? Um, well, we're going to have to kind of come around here if we could, stand as close as we could, and then have everybody join up. Well, I, we don't even need to. I, don't, I, don't well, I would think you'd want to. Oh, well, I would, but they're the ones that are. The ones yeah, if you would could. We'll be part of it. In the front end or the back, maybe? Phone? Okay. Let's take that. Take that. Yeah. Do we need to be a I'm going to hide behind you guys. 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 I'm going to like the ends of the Oops. board is where I'm probably going to get. Mike, I'm sorry if I... Oh, I... I'm, I'm not worried about me. One bit. Okay, then we can take our masks off quick when we take the picture. Hold your breath. Tell me when you're ready so we can do that. Yep, go ahead. And smile. All right. Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs> Good. Perfect. You're welcome. Glad I could help. Totally. Whatever. I don't care. I don't care. However it works. <clears throat> Next on the agenda, we have the virtual legislative call. I don't know if they're on yet or not. Um, they're not on right now, so we will continue. And whenever they do come on, we'll stop because we'll probably only have about 10 minutes. Next, we'll talk about human resource information system. We've had information on this for the last couple weeks. Um, does anybody have any other questions that they'd like to ask about this system? Good morning. Good morning, Beth. Good morning, Amy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You guys got any more to add, or do you guys have any questions for them on this? Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, when we had a conversation at the planning session, I haven't heard any other additional questions from any of the board members. Um, I, so I'm not exactly sure if you guys have any. I don't have any additional information this time. Okay. Mr. Chair, as far as I would be concerned, uh, I don't know what questions I would have to ask. This is not my forte. This is software. Um, based upon everything that I have heard so far, this is, it is what it is. So I have nothing. Thank you. Would anybody like to make a motion on this or more discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I do, I, do have, I do have one question or clarifying question. We talked, um, um, I believe, a week ago. Um, and we talked a little bit uh, about uh, what uh, was called the, the uh, discovery phase of things, and the, um, the cost of that was revealed to be $13,000. Um, <coughs> my question is, do we have the ability if, um, 
Um, we find through uh, going through the process of the discovery phase that we could then um, opt out of this agreement with, uh, with PACOM um, if we found that there would be challenges um, um, in implementation or in interface. Um, and if, if we have the ability at that time or uh, when, or I guess, Mr. Chair, it would be um, uh, when we engage at that discovery level, um, that takes us into full agreement um, with the company, so. Sure, so um, PACOM is a pass-fail. So either it's a go, like implementation and all the discovery and everything that we find, it's either a pass or a fail. If it fails, obviously it's not the right solution for us for our business needs, and so therefore that would be, that would be a stop um, in that uh, endeavor. So um, that answers your question. Okay. Does anybody get any questions? Anybody else? No, I was going to put it on the table to have discussion. So I'll, I'll move to to accept the implementation fee of thirteen thousand for HIRAS for further discussion. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner no, Lemieux, second seconded by Commissioner right. Wincher. I don't have any a, more discussion. I don't have any questions. I have a comment. My comment is: this thirteen thousand is this going to start? I said that is a question. Is this thirteen thousand? Is this going to say that okay, we're moving forward? With PACOM, is that what we're doing? And that's okay, mm -hmm. that question. But my comment is, <clears throat> and uh, I've, well, I haven't sat up at night all that, but I thought about this quite a bit. And the staff, I believe, you presented very well what you can do with this system, uh, what you, you know, want this here, everything to go with. Um, I'm looking at this here, and it's been brought up to me, that, or not to me, but just my own theory is that we have an old system, and I don't believe it's an old system, it's an old company. Because if I'm not part of a county with this system we're currently with, I can go to them and they will install that or get on board with it. And so I look at it as a <clears throat> motorcycle, like I know about motorcycles. They've been, Harley's been around since 1903. It's an old bike, it's an old company, but you can still purchase them moving mm -hmm. forward. In this case, when it's been brought up that it's an old system, I'm, I'm assuming they do updates just like everything else does. They have other uh, <clears throat> information available process that we would have. Uh, I've done, I've called other counties, or one county, and uh, you know, they gave me, you know, it, it's, it works, it takes time as you stated. Again, the information that you've given me, I think is very adequate. Um, but again, I look at it, what hasn't been to my uh, okaying or whatever it is, it's is it a want or a need? And I use that very, uh, I just don't use it as something that we look at this system in my book, is that our old system or the old company we're with is working. It does whatever, we're under contract with it. Um, we have something there that again, I. You can correct me if I'm wrong, this, this uh, PACOM, you still got to do your inputting. The old system, you got to do your old, you know, the, the way we're doing it now, you still got to do inputting. There's going to be mistakes under this system. There will be mistakes under the uh, <clears throat> old system because if you don't put it in cr properly, again, correct me anytime, there's going to be challenges on that end. And <clears throat> based on what I'm seeing and hearing from the staff, I just don't see myself voting for this to bring forward because of the fact that our system now is currently working. It's something that we're still under contract. And again, we haven't given this other system, probably the one we're currently with, maybe they're gonna come up with some new updates. Uh, there's 50,000 reasons why, you know, that th th this is an expense. And like I say, I understand that you will make it work but I, at this time, Mr. Chair, I will be voting no against it, just Thank to you. let you know. And I also request that you Guys, would... I need, I need to interrupt this right yeah. now because the legislators are on, Ron's Perfect. on. So we're going to switch over to the information uh, and visit with them, and then we'll come back and continue where we are, okay? Uh, welcome, Ron. 
Welcome, Ron. Is Paul? Representative Krisha, you're muted. Are you with us? I am. Well, hi. Sorry, I'm trying to do seven other meetings, so. <laughs> I figured that, I figured that. Welcome, Ron, and thank you for hey. giving Thank you for giving us some of your time. Um, I don't know, is Paul invited to, right? Senator Gazelka is, is invited. I believe his staff said he would be responding um, for a few minutes he's before 9.30. He's on the radio right now, so. Uh, what was that, Ron? I believe he's on the radio right now. Oh. Okay. All right. Well, I did send to you, Mr. Chair, if I could, um, I did send you a list of um, legislative discussion items that are important to Morrison County that... Sure. The um, leadership group responded with things that we wanted to highlight to make sure you're aware of, um, pay attention to, and then know to ask us additional questions on if they come up during session. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm not certain how you want to handle that, but we could have staff go through that just to highlight what it is that's on the list. If you as board members have anything in particular, we can add to that. Yeah, do you as board members have any questions? Otherwise, I'll ask staff to come up. Like, uh, First of all, we have corrections. Nicole, would you mind coming up and uh, talking to Ron a little bit about some of the important things that uh, you like to get through? And we'll try to go through the department heads that are here about the subjects. And I'm sure we only have about 10 minutes or so, Ron, of your time. Yeah, because our floor session starts here soon. But I can do both. But your camera just has the document up. So it'd be great if oh, I could actually yes. see who's talking. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. I'm good. All right. Oh, can you see us now? Um, I see me. Oh, you do? And everybody else looks like they have their cameras off. So, okay, now I see the, I see the boardroom. We're all in here, so that's what you, that's where we're at. Okay. Okay, we have Nicole right. Kern. We have Nicole up here, Kern, with uh, corrections. Nicole, if you'd mind going through and talking about some of the concerns you have. Absolutely. Uh, originally, as you know, the governor presented his first budget, and his first budget involved a cut to pass-through funds for CCA and CPO counties for corrections. It was a major cut. He has since revised that budget and has now switched courses and is recommending what amounts to about a 2% increase to our budgets, which is a great thing. Um, the concern is it's never enough. Um, obviously, we haven't received an increase for CCA in over 10 years, while the Department of Corrections funding has continued to keep pace with their salary increases and different things um, on the field services side, which is exactly what we do. We do the same thing as what DOC does, but we do it with 70% of the state, and they do it with 12%. So they're continuing to get their salary increases. Um, the concern is that 2%, you know, we're not going to complain, it's better than a cut. My concern is I'm hoping that there is support for this section of the governor's budget on behalf of Morrison County. Without um, this increase, and if those cuts had happened, we may have lost staff in my office. It, it could have come to that point. We run a thin budget that I'm proud of because we provide great services with the staff I have but I need those staff. Um, so I'm asking for support on that section of the governor's budget. The second item um, as of Friday was heard in the Senate committee and I believe will also pop up in the House omnibus bill. It's language for disproportionate, or I'm sorry, um, disciplinary room time. And that's happening in juvenile facilities. And it's being portrayed as solitary confinement where kids are being locked up in these almost cells for days at a time. And this <clears throat> disciplinary room time is already in DOC licensing and policy. They already police this, and yet they're trying to now legislate it. And we think instead of getting rid of it, work with the detention association, come up with a grid mandate how little it should be used because it should be little. We don't want kids in isolation and being locked up. So um, I'm hoping that there will be push to ask them to work through what they have in place already, which is policy, and work with DOC on that. Okay, thank you, Nicole. <clears throat> Mr. 
I don't know if we're looking Thank for Rachel, call. is that you on? Thank you for joining us. Yeah, um, Senator Gazelka, I just wanted to let you know he's finishing up a meeting, so he'll be here in like two minutes. All right, we're going through the document that I had sent to you and Representative Kresha's office yesterday, so we just started. Okay, next we have okay, the Morrison, Morrison County Deputy Register. Thank you, Chelsea. Good morning, Ron. Before you, I have right, um, Deputy Registrar um, filing fee increases. I know that this, been, has, this bill has been brought forward multiple times, and we've talked about this, not only um, you and I, but as board members as well about the balance between the two revenues on the state and the local county as far as filing fee increases. Um, what I would look for, because this has been brought numerous times, that maybe we could look at reallocating some of the funds from the state to the deputy registrar offices um, as we need to balance our budget and we need our staff here in order to um, provide the services within the deputy registrar office. Um, I also have the self-service kiosk for the DMV use. So this has been um, brought forward, House File 272, author Elkins, um, which would be a self-service kiosk for motor vehicle for tab renewals. Um, our office is in support of this, um, but one thing that we would like to see is for the revenue stream to retain within our local offices that take care of the um, responsibility of the maintenance of the machine and stock. And then I just have a couple under the auditor treasurer's um, priorities. So last year, um, there were many proposals, and this year now, regards to bills around Minnesota elections that have been brought to the table since the past presidential election was unprecedented. Our auditor's office would like to understand what actions are being reviewed for the modifications to law that went into place last year during the pandemic, such as no witness requirements for absentee and mail ballot registered voters and the counting ballots that are postmarked by election day and received after the election date to be counted. This has brought many questions to our office along with the, the voters of Morrison County and the state of Minnesota. Um, also, I have on here is under elections to enable county is the options for choice and election equipment that ensures voter independence and compliance with the ADA requirements and make the voting processes more efficient for all voters. This is specific to voting machines. I also have the modify in-person absentee voting to eliminate the need for applications rather require the use of poll, polling place rosters, also known as electronic poll books, um, poll pads or SVRS or other options to allow for voter sign-in and immediate voter history posting during the early voting process. Um, under the econo economic forecast, under property taxes and financials, um, we know that right now this year, um, we have many things on the line with the $1.6 surplus for fiscal year 22-23 for the state of Minnesota and the approval of the $1.9 trillion relief package. Um, just looking specifically on how it impacts our residents now and in the future years to come with our Morrison County residents. As um, we've seen now that we're flush with funding, um, but in the years to come it may be a huge impact. Um, for us. And then last but not least, I have under general government um, to support the changes to the publication requirements that will reduce the costs of local government when it comes to the cost benefit of the residents of Morrison County. Um, as it's not realized, for example, we have the publication requirements related to delinquent property tax lists, um, multiple sample ballots around election time, and um, publishing the board approved expenditures, which add up to thousands of dollars annually. Okay. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, next, we've got Morrison County Public Works, Steve. Gosk. Mr. Okay. Chair, if I just could, Senator Gazelka, welcome. Yeah, welcome. We are just going through the list. I did send it to your office yesterday um, on various 
topics that are of interest or particular concern to Morrison County. Um, and so we have that for your review. We clearly won't probably get your get time with going through everything in detail here, but wanted to just let you know that's what we have for particular <coughs> points of interest that you know to contact us if there are other questions. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks, Senator. Okay, Steve and Jeff. Good morning, Representative Creshaw and Senator Gazelka. Uh, Steve Bukowski, and I'm here with our landfill manager, Jeff Meyer. We wanted to touch on a few issues uh, related to solid waste. Um, the first one being the Landfill Responsibility Act. Um, th this legislation is uh, geared to set up a three per an additional 3% tax on gross revenues at MSW landfills. Uh, this, these funds would then be utilized to fund projects to uh, reduce and reuse solid waste from a list of projects the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency would create. 40% of that revenue has to be spent on projects in environmental justice communities. Um, along with it would be requirements that the facilities would do costly waste composition studies every three years. There's also an administrative fee per facility to fund the MPCA staff that would manage this program, which initially would be five additional staff at the MPCA. Um, just the 3% tax we would view to, to probably cost our facility $100,000 annually. Um, some of those other costs uh, and how they would be, how they would be implemented uh, are kind of unknown uh, what our uh, facility's cost would be for them. But we don't see that there's very much value that we would, we would uh, uh, see from this legislation for our facility. Chapter 400 puts squarely on the shoulders of the county the responsibilities for managing solid waste. We've accomplished that through a comprehensive solid waste management plan that we've put in place. Uh, currently, solid waste is taxed at 17% for commercial solid waste and 975 for residential solid waste services. That generates $83 million for the state. About $17 million is turned back to the counties in SCORE funds. Um, we get about $100,000 for that. And we've utilized those funds to implement good programs. We have every one of our cities on uh, refuse and recycling services. We have uh, opportunities and programs for every one of our townships. Clean up days annually for both townships and cities that have worked very well. So these successful programs then uh, have resulted in substantial levy requirements, not only the SCORE funds, because in 1998 we were getting about 90,000 in SCORE funds. Now today we get about 98,000. That's how that's gone up. Um, so we, we believe that that this legislation actually would hinder our program. Uh, we would have less support and funding for our townships and cities for the programs they've put in place for many years and have been successful. And so uh, for that reason, we are we're recommending opposition for this legislation. The next, uh, the next item is uh, we want to talk about is PFSs and uh, Jeff Meyer is our landfill manager and, and his Quite a bit of expertise in this area, so he'll, he'll cover this for us. Uh, Senator Gazelka, Representative Krisha, County Morrison County Board. Uh, I've been working with a number of uh, facilities throughout the state of Minnesota and also the League of Cities, and this is a universal problem, just like PFCs are. Uh, the League of Minnesota also opposes legislation, House file, uh, 78 Senate file 156 which is uh, placing PFCs and labeling it as a hazardous substance it's equivalent to calling metal all metal hazardous it's overly broad it's being done administratively uh, there are over 4600 PF compounds that would be under the umbrella of PFCs um, the situation dealing with that is it would put it right underneath the Minnesota Environmental Response and uh, Liability Act or Minnesota Superfund laws. And there is mechanisms to dealing with this. And this would be following the uh, Federal Clean Water Act 
and the Federal Clean Water Act promulgation of standards. And by virtue of doing that, what happens is, is you find uh, comprehensive and practical ways of treating various pollutants in the environment in a very efficient way versus addressing it in a piecemeal uh, experimental process, which is very costly. I know a number of counties have attempted this and it hasn't turned out well for them financially. So that is the House File 78 and Senate File 156. That would be something that uh, would be in opposition. I know the League of, Mis League of Minnesota Cities is also in opposition of that. And there's probably many industrial generators that are also in opposition of that. The other file is House File 79, Senate File 70. Now this one has merit because it is wanting to have PFAS removed from food packaging. That has merit and it's a good idea. But the problem with it, it it's the amendment in it. And that amendment is, is to have a regulatory standard. It's the same thing. It's a regulatory standard for PFOSs of 0.15 parts per trillion placed in uh, law. Now, by placing it in law, it can't change unless the legislature changes that. So if it needs to go up or down, uh, it has to be done by the legislature. It's not being established through the scientific protocol under the Clean Water Act, and it actually is detrimental to the, the process that needs to occur under scientific rigor. Uh, I think that there's parts of the, those bills that make sense, but because of those amendments to that, I think there has to be opposition unless that regulatory standard is removed. Thank you for your time, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Next, we'll move on to Morrison County Social Service and Public Health Legislative Priorities. Brad. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Gazelka and Representative Krisha. There's a few on my list. I know it's been a busy legislative session, and um, so I've just put a few down here. <clears throat> um, we're working hard on trying to to continue some of the waivers due to the pandemic, uh, both in Senate file 1324 and 1160. Sorry, I don't have the House file on here. Representative Krisha, I thought I did, but I do not see it. It does allow for doing remote uh, application orientation process with MFIP clients, doing certain reassessments and targeted case management through uh, remote activity. <clears throat> the second one I have list listed is substance use disorder reform. Senate file 1821 and House file 2115 it allows counties to do screenings and work with individuals who are interested in accessing chemical dependency treatment and allows counties to build MA for peer recovery supports and currently under direct access to be able to do a comprehensive assessment or work with uh, chemically dependent individuals that's going to require an LADC which is a significant licensing process that many counties don't have access to those staff. Um, increasing the local public health grant, of course, during the pandemic, we've seen kind of the hits that this has taken, but this is a grant that allows flexibility and administrative support to counties to, to do local public health, and that's in House File 428 and Senate File 1138. Um, I don't have House Files or Senate Files on the Families First Transition Act, but I know there's a lot of activity around uh, the Families First federal requirements that will allow some one-time flexible funding <clears throat> as well as some short-term funding and allow us to use our 4E dollars in a significantly different way. I know there's always also a few bills of concern around that as well. Um, but really trying to move some of this family's first activity and modernizing our child welfare system is uh, important to counties and in working with DHS on some of these activities. Modernizing of human services programs. I just put this out there because we know some of our systems are significantly outdated and it would allow for some simplification, access and ease for, for most of Minnesotans, some program activity or integrity. Um, so just wanting to continue to modernize our, our uh, public human service program systems. Some of the concerns we have uh, and are working on through MAXA and LPHA um, are allowing parents to, to place without the support of counties, and this is House File 944 and Senate File 1869. 
And again, with the implementation of Families First and the requirements of 4E, um, having counties uh, connected and involved in placements is required and providing a path that is different uh, would require the state to fund some of those. Court appointed counsel in child protection cases also is concerning again an added administrative burden to counties. We currently pay for public defenders for some CHIPS hearings and adding attorneys to the mix, uh, more costs will slow down the court system um, and, and create uh, added uh, problems. The governor's proposed budget also includes a reduction in adult mental health initiative uh, funding and counties have worked hard at these regional organizations to help oversee our mental health system and so reducing that cost uh, could create significant hardship for our region and what we're doing with our providers to improve our mental health system. So that is what I have this morning. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next we'll do, uh, yeah, Morrison County Administrative Legislative Priorities, Deb. Representative Senator, there's nothing that in particular from a bill perspective, it's just some work being done I wanted to give you a heads up on. Um, there is um, particular uh, concern and work um, revolving around that PTSD diagnosis with law enforcement and what impact that has. Um, I think there's legislation out there, 299A is, is something I've been involved in, and diagnosis of a disability um, and diagnosis of uh, separation of a disability really does a lot when it comes to benefits, and supporting that um, is, is important and we need to do it well, and I think legislation just isn't keeping up with current um, activity that's happening. And so making sure that that stuff's funded, the impact on small organizations and on small municipalities is huge. When that is identified and, and diagnosed and para-disabled, um, I think we need to make sure the intent of that law is, is secure and making sure that we um, uphold that, but yet in a way that, that makes sense for everyone involved. Those both needing that support and then those funding it. And so just making you aware of that coming through um, and what it is and what it isn't, because I think anytime, you know, supporting law enforcement is absolutely what we do. This is our business and we need to do that and we need to stand strong in that, but we need to make sure we're um, identifying those benefits and working through those benefits in an appropriate way. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that and more to come um, as we move forward in the, in the coming session probably next year um, before anything comes about, but there's a work group on it. Thank you very much, Deb. Thank you. Um, well, you've heard a lot of our concerns. It's going pretty quick. If you have any comments or anything that you'd like to say before you leave. Um, well, that was uh, like a fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> Is this being recorded, by the way? What was that? Is this being recorded? It is. Awesome. Will you send me the link? I actually have to jump over. We just recessed, and so uh, we're running into our next meeting, and I've got to get ready for a bill. But um, thanks thanks for all the great information, Deb, and the commissioners. You guys do a great job of keeping me up to date, and um, I appreciate all the department heads. And if I can just get a recording, that would be great. I can go back and review this, but um, I, I hate to run and jump, but they messed our schedule up this morning. All right. Thank you, See you Ron. Ron. Thank you, Ron. Yeah. Nice job on the radio this morning. Yeah, and I got a couple more minutes. Uh, I do. Uh, I have a question about how much money is Morrison County getting from the recent federal stimulus? You know, 1.1 billion went to counties. I was just curious how much Morrison County is getting. It's about six and a half million that's slated to come our way. I'm very curious okay. of the details on that. Well, we are too. That's <laughs> that's what we're trying to we're trying to work through. You know what strings are attached how people can use it so it's 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 you know all the extra money coming in now just you know i'm not going to be raising taxes um i never was going to reduce the lga in case anybody wondered uh, but it's it's going to be more complicated than normal so this kind of meeting is helpful for me as we're trying to uh, progress progress through um certainly uh, the stuff on PFAS, I think that's how you say it. I, we're not going to do that. That's, you know, the House might, the Senate won't. Um, the telemedicine and the working through the new technologies to make sure we keep them, I sure want to. I, every, I think everybody does. We just got to figure out a way through. But a, a number of your issues, first time it's on my radar, so that's really helpful. So, yeah, but uh, you know, keep 
to keep talking to us, but I, I do think we'll, we'll get a budget done. Uh, there shouldn't be really any reductions that I'm aware of. Uh, we got to figure out how to use the federal money. You can help us with that. If there's something that you find that there's not clarity, just try to get it to my staff as soon as you can with how the federal stimulus money's coming and we'll work together and figure it out. Mr. Chair, if I could, Senator, I, I think we proved ourselves um, in the latest round of legislation in granting those dollars out. If you look at what county government did in a short period of time um, in comparison to what the state did with that and, and not to knock our partners at, um, down in St. Paul, but I think allowing flexibility, I think allowing counties to respond locally to what it is those needs are is huge. And I think we proved that with that $114 million that went out and, and quickly and well and hit where it needed to hit. Yeah, totally agree. And then the earlier uh, federal stimulus, you know, there was a big fight about how much to get to local governments. The Senate prevailed uh, with the 800 plus million instead of the governor's requested 600 plus million. So I do believe that local governments uh, are more responsive to the getting it to the, the place needed more than the state and the state more than the federal. And so I'm with you. Okay, do we have any other questions? Otherwise, we thank you very much, Senator Gazelka, for being with us today. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, you know, keep it, uh, stay in tune right to the end now. We have a, a, a break coming up, but then it all funnels into a, a mad run to the finish line. So thank you. Thank, thank you very you much. Senator. Thank you. Nice seeing you. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> all right. Okay. We will continue on with our human resource information s system. Uh, Randy spoke on that, and he's done. Does anybody else have any other questions on that? Mr. Chair. Just, just one second. You, you girls have follow-up on this? Okay. <laughs> no? That's enough. <laughs> All right. Good morning, M. Randy, to your comment and your question that you had earlier, um, you know, as you were kind of relaying the system to, you know, a Harley motorcycle, um, I think essentially, you know, the motorcycle is the final product um, or the paycheck per se, but the factory to piece that motorcycle together is kind of what we're talking about here and what we're looking at. Um, I wanted to note also that our current vendor did respond to the RFP with MNCCC, um, and they were eliminated um, on, a, on a couple of different reasons. So there is a newer platform out there, but their implementation and their costs were extremely high, um, higher than any other other respondents uh, that came through. And so <clears throat> based on that and their security assessment, um, kind of hung around in the middle ground where, you know, pay comms rose to the top. So I think there's some concerns there. I think that there are, um, I think that there are, could be potential problems. And I know with the I-Series that that platform sits on, we have multiple other systems. I'm not sure if Amy can speak to them that also sit on that same platform we currently use in which may be going away is that my understanding? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, yes. The, the intent is the I-Series is currently hosted. All of the other systems um, have the opportunity to move off of the I-Series platform, um, which they're in our project list for coming years. Mm -hmm. And Paymate is also on the I-Series today, so that's on our list. Um, and Paymate, as we spoke about last week, Paymate is simply the paycheck. It outputs the paycheck. So in relation to what Beth was um, stating back to you, Randy, um, this will do more than just spit out a paycheck. It will, it will encompass a whole employee and the whole organization um, as a whole. And in relation to, yes, humans can make mistakes and we can input things wrong, but at least this way it's gonna be in one location and will be identified to us. Today's inputting from what I've seen, um, I don't have the comparison chart up today that we had last week, but there's a lot of manual entry. Manual entry means human inputting in separate systems and things can get missed. Um, and this way, the employee and the human resources managers and workers can all view, view the same information and me as an employee could update 
something on myself, let's say I move, I can update my address, they can see it real time, um, we can verify it together. So I do feel that there would be a lot less mistakes making. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions? Commissioner Jelinski. Mr. Chair, thank you. And I, I just want to piggyback off of that. My understanding through this whole entire thing is that we're really talking about an old system that is a payroll system. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a new system that is a payroll system, hands down, not a question about that, but it's also an HR system. And I think that's the piece that, that I don't have to think. That's the piece that sold this whole thing to me, mm -hmm. is we have an HR person dealing with HR. This is the tool that we put in the toolbox for the HR person, if you will. A couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to be lost for a term here, so I hope Brad or somebody can help me out. Morrison County said we're going to do this by ourselves and we're not going to have the state help us. Help me out with uh, that. The merit? Merit system. <clears throat> and we're doing that because we have an HR staff. Yep. We're doing that because we're going to be moving into, in my opinion, to make it smooth, this new piece of software. That is why I have supported this from the start. I just wanted to make sure that I was on the right page. And, and Miss Amy, thank you. You, once again, uh, brought me back onto the same track that I thought that I was on. So Correct. thank you. Correct. Yeah, so the, the payroll is just one, one component of, of many that, <coughs> that we can look to to streamline um, the services that we have. And not only is it for HR, it's also for staff. And it's also for managers um, to be able to see where they're at um, in real time with, with their staff for coverage issues, for budgetary reasons. Um, in the event of uh, overtime, they can keep an eye on that premium pay that goes out. And so they can see, you know, through scheduling components, you know, they can have more control over that as opposed to, I need a shift filled and I'm gonna fill it now because <laughs> I don't have time to, to look around and figure out who's worked what when. So you were correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Anybody else have any comments or questions? Commissioner Blaine. Uh, Mr. Chair, so uh, uh, a question that was posed to me that, uh, that uh, just come back into memory here now that I wanted to ask. The, the question was posed to me. We have 87 counties in Minnesota and, and the, the system under consideration right now Morrison County would be the fourth county in the state that utilizes um, uh, this system out of out of 87 counties in the state. <clears throat> so, what what do what do we know that 83 other counties in the state don't aren't, aren't seeing? If you know if this is if this is um, you know, that's kind of been rolled to us as, a, as this is kind of a, a, a Cadillac system as far as the capabilities and uh, uh, of what it can do. Um, so the question was posed to me, what, what are we knowing that, um, let's say, 80, 83 other co counties in the state are, are not or are choosing to do um, something different? Any, any thought sure. on that? So <clears throat> I think that leads to a lot of speculation. <laughs> I think that's a big question to, to answer. I think that, um, you know, each county has, you know, their primary core business, but also some have nursing homes, some have daycares, some have other business. And so dependent upon the systems that they're currently using, they may not be either ready to move to a new platform. Um, I mean, there could be a gazillion different things, but for us, we are recognizing and looking forward to and have been for the last few years that we're running into an issue with our I-series. We're running into an issue with how we process payroll. We're running into an issue where we're managing multiple systems. And um, to help eliminate some of that, there are these tools that we can pick up and utilize. I think for us to be, <clears throat> you know, looking into the future and realizing, hey, this is a need, which has brought us here today, I think is, um, I don't know, just kind of us staying on top of what we need to do and not to say that any other county isn't. I just think that, um, depending upon what their situation is, that is the 
the need that MNCCC recognized that across the board there were counties that needed something more than what they currently had. And so um, there were several counties that participated in that process, um, and I know that they're moving forward with a couple of pilot counties. So, I mean, they really want to come up with a solution that's going to benefit a majority of Minnesota counties. Um, and Mr. Chair, if I could too, when you say that it's a Cadillac, I think that isn't the case. I think correct. what we looked at was a very modest system um, in terms of both delivery and cost. There are a number of systems that are, are what I would view as Cadillacs that are far more expensive. That we looked at it and we said we need something better, um, but we don't need um, every bell and whistle. We don't need the shiny um, does it all uh, for us plus. Um, we want to have something that's basic. And I think that's how we operate in general. We want to have a core delivery in a reasonable, um, in a reasonable way that costs, you know, middle ground. We don't need the best and we don't, we don't want, we want to get away from not having what it is we really need to do good work, but we don't need, we don't need that Cadillac. And so that was just maybe a difference there. Yeah. Mr. Chair, if I could respond from an IT perspective, I get that there's 87 counties. Um, but when we look at software, um, all software, tax software, um, the Canvas software for land services, the public work software, and now the HR software, we don't look at 87 counties equally. Um, we're all, there's small, medium, and large, and then there's the state of Hennepin. So we don't look at, sorry, that's how we kind of classify our counties. Um, so when we look at software implementation, you have to look at the small counties and what they have available as local resources versus the medium and the large counties. Um, a lot of the larger counties do have in-house developers that develop their own HR software programs. They don't purchase the COTS or the, the off-the-shelf um, product that we're looking at. We're looking at somebody that, a, a third party vendor that's created this product, they specialize in HR because we don't have in-house developers. The other three counties are in the same boat as us. Um, there's many other counties in the same boat as us, but they might not have the timing right. They might not be coming to the end of their contract or they may not have this as a priority right now. They, you know, it's, it's all timing. So for our county, it was the right time. There is a need, which is why MCCC, who does represent 87 counties, started the RFP process for the Human Resources Program. I'm not sure how many counties jumped on it, but they, um, once they get that contract, then they allow any county to either join that contract or choose their own uh, vendor, which is what we chose to do. Um, but it, it is how we look at it on an IT side is 87 counties are not created equal and we have to look at our um, place and time right now. And I feel today is the, the right time to move forward with a new system. Uh, again, you know, this is really looking at that whole factory and trying to streamline processes internally so things can run smooth and quicker um, and, and really getting that, that factory just, mm -hmm. just perfect, hopefully, yeah. at some point. Well. Perfect Thank you. Does anybody <laughs> else have any other questions or any more questions? I, I would like to add one thing. I, uh, I appreciate you bringing this forward with the implementation phase instead of the whole impl implementation process like we had earlier. So thank you for doing that. It makes it more palatable for me. Thank you. And I just like one clarification with what Randy had mentioned. So if we would take the system we have today and update that to what we need today, number one, you're not sure they could do it, and number two, it would cost it would cost us as much, if not more, money than going to the system. Is that correct? Correct. If well, we wanted to, Mr. Chair, if we want to stay with the same vendor no, or just same. stay with the same product, because the products are different. Mm -hmm. To do what we need today, the current product doesn't do. All it does is create a payroll oh, okay. paycheck. Okay. Um, to do what we, we need today, we need to buy the whole package. And that would be a whole other product through the same vendor. Um, we would have to go through all the same um, factors that we went with, that Beth mm -hmm. went through with Paycom to verify that they're going to work with everything. And then we'd have the same implementation fee, and then we'd have the ongoing support fee. Um, they were a respondent to the RFP. Um, the price of the implementation fee was astronomical you guys would probably have turned us down six months ago it was hundreds of thousands it of was dollars. just I, I, yeah i don't know if i can 
say the the, the amount here, oh, but um, but I know it was a very large amount. And you guys would have kicked us out of here six months ago. So <laughs> and you would have never heard about it. Um, no, <laughs> Beth, Beth did do her due diligence and found a product that is that middle of the roll, but does does do a very good job um, with what we need today. Okay, thank you very much, Any, Mr. Chair. If I may, so um, so. To make sure I'm clear, so what we're what we're under consideration today is is that um, discovery or implementation phase um, at this at this point in time. And when we looked at this or had met about this the last time, then we were looking at this um, this whole issue in a number of different phases. This, and this was like phase four was the implementation phase, and then and then phase five was, you know, was putting everything into action, executing on that. Um, one of the one of the um, discussions we had earlier on this was that um, outside of the cost of things was the fact that we would continue to run our current system side by side with uh, with while we're looking into or or implementing. Um, uh, the PACOM system. So, for clarity's sake, um, will will we continue to run the current system that we're operating right now only through this implementation phase, and then we will drop that off and that cost off um, going forward, or? Or will we need to continue to run both of them um, into what I'll call uh, the fifth phase or the execution phase? Or, or I, I don't remember how we what we termed it, but sure. you, I think you know what I'm talking yep. about. Yep, I know what you're saying. So um, we would want to run those systems side by side, of course, during the implementation phase as we go through the discovery and build out a new system. And then, um, you know, you want to make sure that all your detail and all your information and your employee information is, is, is accurate and comparable to our current payroll system um, and matches up with the new to ensure that there's no details that got dropped. I mean, there's um, make sure that, <clears throat> you know, codes are accurate and make sure that we can pull the reports that we need. You know, you want to make sure that the system is fully functioning before you drop your initial one. So... Um, I think once once that's good and all the testing has been done, um, we would then drop the old vendor. So, so, so Mr. Chair, um, uh, the other thought that comes to mind now is is more procedural, and and so I understand. Um, and thank you, Beth, for clarifying mm -hmm. that um, uh, for me. But so, if if under consideration today is the is, is the thirteen thousand dollar cost um, and the and and um, and us granting the uh, ability to enter into that stage four or that discovery phase? So then, procedurally, Mr. Chair, will this issue come back again before this board uh, for consideration at the conclusion of the discovery phase before we? Um, would um, go into to executing this fully. Mr. Chair, I guess that's up to you on how you want to do that. I think the assumption is going into this, we wouldn't move forward until we know everything's ready to go and we're processing payroll and we're not and we're not charged until we use that component or those components of the system. Um, if you want a, if you want to report back and you want to identify that and then kind of give the blessing on the call to move forward based upon what we learned through that process, by all means, we can do that. Um, I think the assumption is is that um, the intent is certainly that that it's going to work and that we're moving forward to have that work, um, but we, we absolutely can come back to you with that if you would like a second chance at approving that moving forward. That's not a problem. I, I guess that I would be looking at that as if if I approve to go ahead with this process and you spend the $13,000, the $13,000 is to figure out whether our system, whether we can take over this system and it'll work for us. If at that point that you decided that this system will work, 
I don't believe that I'm thinking here that I'm not going to go and get the system. Right, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, my assumption was there was a lot of uh, questions on compatibility. Is it compatible with our government? I believe that this implementation phase is going to determine if it's compatible with our government software systems, per se, or whatever you mm -hmm. want to. Is, is that, am I mm -hmm. correct? And yes. if it is compatible, then you'll come back to us and say, yes, it'll work with our system. We need to move to the next phase, per se, as Commissioner Blaine was talking. Is that correct? Yeah, so um, essentially this is the implementation phase um, and the training um, is, is building that system. And like I mentioned earlier, it's a pass-fail. So if at any point this fails and it doesn't work for us, then we're not going to move forward. Correct. Thank so, you. So, yeah. Commissioner Wincher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So again, the piggyback and everything was being said. This thirteen thousand, that's just kind of like, okay, this is our down payment, whatever, to get this moving. Then we're going to be charged. It might take two months, three months to get this. Whether we can do it, we'll be charged a monthly fee from this new system. Is that correct? So, no. or am I incorrect? On no, that? that's incorrect. So the thirteen thousand dollars will get us to um, build a new system, do the implementation, do the training, and then once we go live with that new payroll system is when we start paying those fees. So whether implementation takes four, eight, 12 weeks, we're not paying for that until it's live and up and running. So if I may, Mr. Chair, to convince me to go the other way, that I would like maybe to bring that back to a vote. That would be a, so to get their information in two or three months, again, it's up to you, Mr. Chair, to decide that. But again, I would prefer to have that come back and say, okay, we spent the 13000 This is the quirks we're finding. This is we're not. Then we'd approve. But again, you're the chair. And that I would respect be fair. Yeah. Does anybody have any other questions? Well, well, Mr. Chair, it's either a pass or fail. It's either going to work or it's not going to work. If it's not going to work, you certainly don't need to bring that back to me. And if it's going to work, you certainly don't need to bring that back to me either. That's just my two cents. But however it works. Well, it's it, going to make uh, yes. Randy feel more comfortable. I don't yep. see it hurting to bring it back. I don't think we're losing anything here because at the time of this stage where we're spending the $13,000, you're going to come back to say, yes, the system will work for us. And if it doesn't, you're going to come back and say, no, we've got to go a different direction. Okay. So it, I don't have, am I correct with yes, that? Yes, Mr. Chair, we're on the same team here. We yeah. want the same thing as you, you do um, in terms of a system that works well for this organization, a system that meets the needs that we are looking to meet. So we're all in that together. Um, it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot of um, detail to implement something like this, but we're going to work hard and, and do that as with any software transition. So we're, we're all looking for the same thing. We're looking for a solution that meets the needs. And so this, this is absolutely not a problem to come back and let you know where we're at. I intended that. Certainly the discussion we've had up to this point lets me, leads me to believe that you care a lot about mm -hmm. it. And so we want to make sure we're meeting those needs for you and for us. And so all of us are working towards the same solution. Not okay. a problem to bring it okay, back. So right. Then I guess I have to ask the question, is our motion that we made the correct motion uh, to go with the HR system, or is it only to go with the HR system through this implementation phase? Well, before us is the, my motion was what's before us, the approved PACOMS HRS implementation fee of $13,000. That was my motion. Okay, sounds good. Any other questions? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye to move aye. forward. Aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll see next. in a few months. <laughs> Hopefully less. <than> that. <laughs> yeah. Persistent. Next, I'd like to bring up while we have some of the department heads here uh, that moves into that payroll position that we talked about uh, that we voted down last two weeks ago. Uh, I went to the meeting of the department heads and they expressed a lot of concerns about uh, not having filled that position uh, with somebody for payroll. Um, and I guess I have some of the same concerns because payroll is not just something that anybody can do. Uh, other people in administration office, they're working here to do what they do. And I, I look at payroll as being a whole other issue here than what uh, than what we have, and so I'd like to discuss this again to see if we can move forward on this. Um, 
Does anybody have any comments? I, I know I was at department head meeting and you guys had some comments there. Uh, why, excuse me, Mr. Okay. Chair, why wasn't this on the agenda? Did you just think of this right now? Well, I, I didn't know where to put it on the agenda. You know, so if you want to wait. The proper, wait, thing, if, the proper thing is those that are in the majority, which was the no votes, Yes, it's them to bring it up again. That's the proper oh, okay. thing. Okay, the ones that voted no for it are the ones that should bring it up? That's, that's the proper the, thing. Okay. Yeah. That would be According. the parliamentary. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, then I guess I can leave it at that if that's what you feel about that for right now. But uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I guess you guys don't want to talk about that today. I have no problem discussing it, but I just don't like how okay. it's happening. That's, that's my two cents. Okay, and the reason I, I well, you know, I guess I, you know, uh, Mr. Chair, you know how strongly I feel about process, yep. and 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 procedure, and um, for for anyone that doesn't understand um, um, an issue like this when it is when it is voted down, it's the same as as uh, when Commissioner Lemire and I were in the legislature and a bill that is that is. Uh, voted on and fails is the issue that issue then becomes dead until uh, uh, the only way that that's brought forward again is if a member of the prevailing side um, wishes then to to uh, bring that issue uh, back up again and so um, I, I kind of echo uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Lemire's uh, uh, comment on on that uh, we're going to uh, we're going to protect uh, the process and the procedure here and um, and I don't uh, I don't uh, want to you know just uh, all of a sudden have this show up um, here when procedurally the only way this issue comes back for discussion is if uh, uh, one of the members of the prevailing side would bring it forward. Okay, well I thank you for that because I did not understand that, that the ones that voted no were the ones to bring it up. So um, if that's the case, I'll leave it alone right now. So thank you. Okay, we'll move, do we want a break guys or do you want? Why wouldn't we? Yeah. Yeah, okay.
Everything is is uh, going forward. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how how that would happen. I'm, if they can say they really do it, you're gonna have a hard time. Yeah, well, that's what they're. That's what I hope this thirteen thousand does. But you know, I say that's what I just want to. That's the way I. Think. But there is. I'm taking that as the thirteen thousand dollars. They come back and tell us that everything will work. The question is, we're not spending additional money from PACOM the nine thousand. They're not charging us that until they officially roll out. Yeah. Right. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's right. I'm gonna get some coffee. We got two more minutes. So then, we'll, that's what you understand. You're the chair. That's what it is. But the process all came back. Okay. Nigel gets back on. Yeah, you can. That's back there. Somebody's going to talk to Beth. She canceled the trip. I have to cancel the trip. We can't do this work without people. With no end in sight, with no support. That's what I just told them, you guys. This is messing with people's lives. I, I did everything. I did everything I can. What do you want to see? I don't even want to talk about it. Coffee. I gotta see. 
can just thank for your gavel, Mr. Chair. Okay, let's get started again. Sheriff's report. Morning, Mr. Chair, members of the Morning. board. Morning, Sheriff. Morning, Morning Sheriff. Sheriff. I think, yeah, so we can start with a uh, request for board action. So it sounds like my chief deputy was here last week. I was out of town training. He gave a presentation regarding uh, we need to update our canine dog, uh, one of them, which is Rocky. Um, he's going to be eight years old in May. He's been doing a phenomenal job with apprehension and drug enforcement. Uh, the issue we have is he's sick. He's lost 25 to 30 pounds in the last few months to year. Um, he still has a drive. Like I said, he's still doing well, but most of the time uh, canine dogs don't even last that long. And I know the kind of the pack he was in for training purposes, they, they've all been retired. So I think we need to look in the future just for a replacement. Uh, unfortunately, it does cost some money. Um, we're looking at $16,000. And uh, if the board approved it, we'd be looking to take the money from the jail reserve fund. Um, that $16,000 would include all training associated to the canine, as well as the purchase of the dog itself. With that, I'll open it up for questions if there's any. Anybody have any questions, uh, Randy? And again, Mr. Chair, uh, Sheriff, these dogs are in need. Um, but my, my question is, how old are these dogs when you get them? I mean, when they're completely trained, are they a year old, six months old? Yeah, so they, uh, they work on obedience training um, prior to our officers taking over. And usually it's like right around a year and a half to two years when we get them. Um, in this case, we'd be getting the dog from the same bloodline like we have been, the Czech Republic. We're gonna try and do things differently. The 16,000 would be the worst case scenario. Um, uh, what we would do is have the company kind of train the dog and then we would just interface in the end because uh, we have an experienced handler. Um, so he's kind of, all the most of the training he's aware of, he would just come in the end, get acquainted with the dog the last three to four weeks of the 13 week program, which would cut our costs down significantly. But again, it would be worst case scenario at 16,000. So to answer your question, uh, Commissioner, it'd be about a year and a half, two years old when we get the dog. Thank you. Anything else? Now, could I get a motion to accept this? So moved, Mr. Chair. Got a motion by Commissioner second Lemire, that. seconded by Commissioner Blaine. Any further discussion? No question. Right. What happens to Rocky? Does he stay with Deputy Sherpin? So what we've done in the past is the canine handler that ran the dog for the number of years, uh, they would, the dog would retire and stay with the owner, which uh, all costs would go towards the handler at that point. Thank you. Commissioner Blaine. So, so Sheriff, um, we're gonna bring in a, a, a replacement for Rocky. Will that dog then go to um, that same officer who Rocky has been with um, going forward? Or will, or will that replacement dog um, be assigned to a, a, a different member of your staff? So Commissioner, the dog would go to the same uh, deputy that's retiring uh, his canine and because of his experience with the dog and the canine handling skills that he has that's why he wouldn't have to go through the whole 13-week program he would just get involved in the tail end of the training okay very good thank you yep. and mr chair i'm going to go off tangent here a little bit i know it's uh, COVID time but you used to go to schools with kids with these dogs and i, I don't know if you can continue doing that I thought that was such a great program to show the, the, uh, the youth that how these dogs work, and I hope you continue doing that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's a great PR tool, but yeah, with COVID, it's kind of, uh, school has to be comfortable as well. So. Sean, I just got a question for curiosity's sake. Does the old dog help the new dog at all, or when it's retired, it's done? You know what I mean? Sometimes, yep. do they help each other or not? Uh, not in this case, when it's recent. I'm sorry. Sorry. 
try that. Okay. So in this case, the dog would retire. There'd be no interaction okay. with the new canine. All right, thank you. Okay, we have a motion and second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. And then I'll just uh, go through the monthly report of February very briefly. Um, as always, I share a few photos. The first photo is Camp Ripley. Um, we did some active shooter training. And of course, everyone knows we can't predict where there's gonna be an active shooter incident. So what we do is uh, whether the incident occurs at a school, church, business, uh, in this case, uh, for training purposes, it was a military base. So we just work with our, our counterparts and we make sure that we're aware of each other's skills and training. So it was valuable scenario-based training at Camp Ripley that we did in the month of uh, uh, February. And our entire staff didn't go through this, it was just the personnel who were working on the dates of the training. The next picture is, uh, there's Rocky, that's gonna be our canine dog that uh, we're gonna uh, retire. And again, because of his sickness and age, that's why we're looking at retiring him. However, as I mentioned, he was invaluable. He had a stellar career. Um, in this case, he helped a local agency apprehend a suspect. We assisted Little Falls Police Department. Um, just to give you some highlights, this picture was taken after a, we uh, apprehended a suspect. He had a felony warrant. Uh, he took off on foot. His warrant was for assault and drugs. Um, it was over an hour that the suspect was last seen and they called in our canine. Um, at this point, Rocky started a track. Um, he eventually acquired a track. He went from house to house through several yards, um, across streets, and eventually down an alley to a back door of a residence. Um, at that point, um, law enforcement knocked on the door and got consent to search the residence. Uh, the canine handler made multiple requests and calls. Uh, sheriff's office, canine present, come to the sound of my voice. So he did multiple commands and no response. And eventually the suspect was located hiding in an attic crawl space and he was apprehended. So it just shows you the value of the dog. And again, um, Rocky, he's a great dog. He's vicious, he's scary, but at the <laughs> same time, with the, because of his sickness, that's why we're looking at the replacement. So he did some good things in his career. Uh, moving on to training, you can see we, uh, as mentioned, we had active shooter training, we had SWAT training. We had eight officers attend medical examiner training. Uh, this was put on at Camp Ripley. Um, we had Midwest uh, Medical Examiner's Office do the training for us, Dr. Quinn Strobel, who's the medical doctor. Um, basically, if you recall, we're the deputy coroners that go to the scene. We uh, analyze the scene, process the scene, um, and then what we do is we call the medical examiner and they determine whether or not the body needs to go for an autopsy and or if the body can be released to the funeral home. So we went over that training and we, we also did joint training with the Little Falls Police Department. Um, moving on to our criminal complaints, you'll see we had 68. I'm just gonna highlight uh, what we've seen the most of. If you see the five o'clock position, the orange triangle, we had nine disturbing the peace. The eight o'clock position in purple, we had 16 thefts. And the 15% above that, the light blue, we had 10 fraud, which is gonna be our scam complaints. If you move forward to our traffic citations, we had 211 traffic citations for February. Um, I looked at last year's, 2020, we had 112. So the deputies are still on pace, they're out there, they're, they're uh, staying active and vigilant throughout our county and doing a good job. And then you'll see our two-year comparison. Everything kind of went up with the exception of a cu couple things. Um, and again, the total number of complaints and the non-criminal complaints, that's based off the numerous traffic stops and the more traffic stops that the deputies are doing. And of course, our total inmate count went down because, it, because it's still COVID, COVID related. If you go through our inmates, we averaged 21. And uh, the total number of inmates to include out of county inmates, um, we averaged 24. 
And then the pay to stay, I'm sorry, out of county inmates, what we, we had 11 for other counties and the revenue collected was 4,840. So you can see we're starting to bring in a little bit of revenue, everything helps. Um, the nice thing about out of county inmates is we don't have to bring them into our jail and isolate them. Um, they're already isolated for the quarantine process before they are brought over to Morrison County. So we're able to uh, put them with the flow uh, general population versus isolate them. So that's helping. So I continue to hopefully, hopefully we can continue to see those numbers uh, for revenue generated and move forward. Are there any questions for me? Mr. Chair? Commissioner Jelinski. Sheriff, and I'm probably not talking about uh, St. Gabriel's Hospital. I'm probably not talking about a nursing home. But majority of deaths in Morrison County, do the majority of deaths get um, sent down south to the, uh, to, to the coroner for an autopsy? Uh, no, not really. A lot of them, if there's a medical history, if there's, uh, uh, there, there's meds, there's uh, yep. prior uh, diagnosed with uh, whether it's cancer yep. or anything like that, most of the time it's going to be a release to the funeral home. Okay. Um, however, any of our critical incidents where we have like a car accident, some type of fatality, yep. um, those even if there is a history, normally they're gonna be sent for an autopsy just to figure out was it the, the event, was it the crash that actually uh, um, was involved or was it some pre-medical sure. existence. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anybody got anything else? Thank you, Sheriff. Thanks, thank Sheriff. you. Uh, thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Social service report. Brad. Good morning, Mr. Chair Commissioners. Good morning, Brad. So I'm being followed, as you can see. Um, I'd like to just welcome Kim Johnson, our new account tech in social services. Um, she comes to us from a chiropractor here in town, so we're glad to have her. She started yesterday was her first day. Welcome. So Wonderful. just welcome here to introduce board, her. Kim. Thank Excellent. Thank you. So that's it. I'm sure you left a I'm, great I'm, big you better void leave over there. there. You <laughs> better leave Thanks before for they for coming over questions. here. <laughs> Sounds yeah. good. Thanks, Kim. Thank you very welcome. much and welcome. Uh, the second thing I have on the social service agenda is just a letter that we receive gladly every year from the Minnesota Department of Human Services recognizing our uh, fiscal department in terms of all the reports that are needing to be accomplished. And so just like to congratulate our congratulate them as well as the staff they work with to make sure that all those reports are done and uh, on time. So just uh, information to share with the board and a thank you to our staff. I'll move on to the public health report if that's okay. Yes. So I have a couple of food, beverage and lodging RBAs. The first is to approve a consumption and display permit for the Ramey store for a period of April 1st to March 31st. And the sheriff has approved this. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Wincher, seconded by? Blaine. Commissioner Blaine, any further discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Thank you. The second food, beverage, and lodging license is a new mobile food unit license for Moto Grub beginning May 1st of 2021 and goes through September 21st or September of 2021. I'll move on that, Mr. Chair. Got a motion by Commissioner Jelinski, seconded by? Second. Commissioner Wincher, any further discussion? Who is Moto Grub? It's know. mobile, so it's oh. everywhere. <laughs> so, uh, so, question, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Brad, um, uh, if even if these uh, mobile food uh, units um, are operating within the city of Little Falls, Morrison County still has jurisdiction to license them. Correct. Commissioner the, Lemire. The total price rate on that, or something goofed up on them? Um, let's I'd move the oh I'm sorry total three hundred and sixty dollars should be correct yes just because it says one seventy two ninety three two thirty seven but that's right they might have not put the the plan review when they did the RBA and added that on so but what the base fee mobile unit fee and the plan review is like what the cost is yeah and that does not add up so. Yeah. Good catch, Mr. Lemire. Okay, uh, we have a motion, a second, any other questions? 
Not all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. All right, then I'll ask Cindy and Sarah to come up. We're gonna do a report on our Min Choices activities in Morrison County. Cindy supervises the public health staff that do more of the long-term care Min Choices and Sarah supervises the staff and social services and end up doing more of the disability uh, Min Choice assessments. So I will turn it over to them. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning commissioners. Good morning, Chair. A Min Choices assessment is that tool that the Minnesota Department of Human Services started about five years ago, and that's the, the one-stop shop, so anybody that needs services from tiny tots that have a disability all the way to our seniors that are looking for services in their home or in uh, interest to move into an assisted living. So it's a very, very encompassing assessment that's done by assessors here at the county. Um, typically, it's intended to assess people that need services above and beyond what straight MA will pay for. So it's looking to get people onto the waivered programs. And if you look at the next slide, that's the entire list of the waivered programs that a person could be eligible for based on what their disability is, what kind of services they're looking for, and it's really just a very broad assessment. So this chart shows you how many assessments we've done in 2020. So it breaks it down with social services new, um, public health new, reassessments. So a new assessment means those are people that are not on these services and they're seeking this assistance. So those are the new assessments. The reassessments, which are our highest number as you can see, are all those ones that are on this program already and we do have to assess them on an annual basis it's just to you know ensure their needs haven't changed um, any extra services they might be eligible for budget increase or decrease those sorts of things um, the cor means county of residence and in the under 65 world that means those are our people that are living in foster care or those kind of time excluded facilities that are not our financial responsibility, but we still have to assess them and send that assessment to that county for their waiver. So as you can tell, reassessments are most of, of what we do, but um, news are, have been creeping in here recently, so. So an example, if we put a 17 year old on a waiver, they will get an assessment for the next many, many, many years if they're getting a caddy waiver because of a disability that could go into adulthood. It would be every year we would see those and have to do a Newman Choices, so. Yeah, their service agreement span is only for 365 days. So if we don't reassess them before the end of that 365 days, that span ends and they're no longer on that service. So you have to be very careful to track that and make sure that we're, you know, people aren't falling off these and that we're assessing them timely. Um, staff FTE, so social services has three full-time assessors um, and their caseload is a combination of new and reassessments. Average is about 11 to 12 a month. We do have some months that are pretty high. February is one of those months for some reason where we have 16 reassessments, but average-wise usually around that number. Um, social services assessors hold on to their assessments until they can verify that waiver eligibility is determined. Um, so they talk with the family about what program they want. They make sure that they're financially eligible, they're you know, certified disabled, all of those sorts of things before they move that on to that ongoing case manager that manages their budget and their needs for that year. Um, and then public health has one full-time assessor and then all public health case managers are certified as Min Choices assessors and they do about five to six Min Choices assessments per year. So for coverage, it's really nice to have all of these assessors, especially now for social services. I have one that's about to go on maternity leave and then one that's going out for knee surgery. So Cindy and her team are very good about helping provide that coverage and we, you know, we try to cross train between the over 65 and the under 65 so that we can provide that coverage. So that works out really well. Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, uh, Sarah, if we go back a, uh, a slide sure. to uh, slide 38 in, uh, and the, the, the uh, blue bar with the um, uh, county of residence. So clarify, is, is that mean that we, 
that we will service an individual in our county who is not a resident of our county and then we bill that to their to their county of residence or am I, re am I understand misunderstanding this? So we would do the assessment, which means that is our staff time, our cost, but as far as the waiver and the service need and all of that financial responsibility, that goes to that county of financial responsibility. And remember, we have people in the same situations in other counties. So those counties would do those assessments for our clients. So it's kind of in a way a wash, if that makes sense. So um, I'm, I'm just curious why they, why a resident of Morrison County would be having the assessment done in, in, an, in another county or vice versa. Can you I can, explain? Yeah, well, what, in the past it wasn't like that. So what, you know, assessors would travel sometimes three, four hours to complete these assessments. And so I think the state looked at efficiency and would it make more sense for those assessments to be done by the assessment team in that county versus having all that travel time. It's also what's called, some individuals are in a time excluded facility, so they're in adult foster care, which means if they come and live in a foster home here in Morrison County, from let's say Duluth, that's Itasca County, they are responsible for that individual's cost throughout the entire time excluded stay. Except for when it's time to renew the waiver, then we have to go out and do the min choices. Similar to like when we, we may have a client that moves down to the cities to live in a foster home because that's a place that can have their needs met in a better way than here or maybe it's closer to a sibling or something of that nature. So that county would do that reassessment. We still are, we still pay for the waiver or the waiver comes out of our budget, those kinds of things. So it's called a time excluded care. Okay, thank you because that, that makes more sense now. It's a great analogy mm -hmm. that way in, in, in using the, let's say foster care people or people who mm -hmm. are who are staying in our county but aren't uh, aren't gaining residency there or claiming residency there. Correct. So thank you for You're clarifying. welcome. And the revenue for Min Choices assessments comes through that random moment. So at the end of the day, we get reimbursed for the time to do just the assessment based on the random moment reimbursement. So it should balance out mm -hmm. in theoretically. Counties that have a lot of facilities in them sometimes are extraordinarily busy trying to do all the assessments for people that reside in their county but may not necessarily be their own residents. Say Anoka, you know, St. Cloud, those kind of counties, sometimes they'll be like, really, we don't have the capacity to do this because there's a 20-day timeline to complete some of those or there's a timeline. And sometimes they'll say, we'll get it done, but maybe not when you want it done because they can't keep up with the volume. We don't have that, you know, we're, we're able to keep up on that. So. Even as close as Wadena County, um, because they have the uh, Lakewood reflections, and people that go in there with mental health issues and need to be assessed for services, they are really bogged down at times in Wadena County, keeping up with the number of people that are in that building that need to be assessed. So we fortunately don't have a lot of those kinds of facilities. So, Super. Thank you. So the next slide, we kind of alluded a little bit to, you know, how our revenue is gen generated, but this uh, graph just shows a, um, you know, from 2018, 2019, 2020, broke down between social services and public health. So as you can see, our revenue has increased by the year. You know, that's mostly based on the number of assessments increasing and all of that. So I don't know if you have any questions. It's pretty self-explanatory, but. So the launch of the revised Min Choices application will be happening by the end of 2021. They've been promising this to us for about four years or more. Um, basically, all of the people that are on uh, health plans, so our Blue Cross, our UCARE, our Medica, PMAPs, as well as EWs, CADIs, SNBC, all those folks, we were doing a separate assessment for the health plan than the Min Choices, and they're finally going to integrate that. So the health plans have been working carefully with DHS to make that happen. They've started just a little bit of preliminary training with the intent that our training will happen pretty intensely starting end of August, early September with a planned rollout November, December. Um, they're still telling us that the rollout will be everybody at one time on one day, which historically hasn't been very successful. So we're hoping that they change that to a, a staggered rollout so that we don't have to go first. <laughs> um, 
but there's a lot of training that will happen between now and September, October to get our staff ready with this new platform. Last year at this time, we told you it was coming, and so here we are, still waiting. It's coming. <laughs> so Amidst the pandemic, they've pushed forward. So just a few other updates and changes, just lots of things coming down from the state level and federal level as far as um, changes to the waiver system. And I'll just briefly touch on them because that's, you know, Jeff Bowman at some point will be giving a waiver report and he'll go into more depth. But, you know, the waiver we imagine is, is the under 65 world and we're just starting to hit that. And really that's just about simplifying the waiver system. Um, eligibility doesn't change, none of that changes. It's really just about streamlining services. Um, there won't be four waivers anymore, CADI, DD, CAC, BI, they're gonna move them into two waivers depending on where you live, either residential or community. So they're gonna, and they're gonna make it more of an individualized budget, um, those sorts of things. So we've already started that in January of 2021. It's kind of a three year phase out and really right, what started right now is just streamlining the services. Um, the other one that's coming with Min Choices, um, the revision is CFSS, and that's gonna be changing PCA services, personal care assistance. Again, eligibility isn't different. Um, it's still, you still need dependencies in bathing, eating, dressing, grooming. It's just about streamlining, making it more individualized, um, opening it up to people being able to purchase goods, being, um, parents being able to be the support worker for their child when the old system wouldn't allow you to, those sorts of things. Um, and then again, we told you about the waiver audit last March when we were here, and they, that still hasn't happened either. So that's coming in 2022. And then last but not least, our assessor certification and monitoring. So when a new assessor is trained, there's about 30 hours of initial training just with online modules. And that doesn't include the time that we send them out with other assessors um, back in the day when we still did face-to-face. -face. Currently, all of these assessments, for the most part, are being done via the phone because of COVID. Um, all of our assessors have to be recertified every three years. They have to have a total of 45 continuing learning units in that three-year span in order to be recertified. And then the state does monitor to make sure that we don't have an assessor who has let their... Uh, certification lapse or that we're not using an assessor who isn't quote unquote certified. So we have to make sure that we're paying attention to our assessors when they're due to be recertified and watch that. And all of ours have been extremely good. We don't have anybody that's lapsed or have any issues with that. So we're not on the radar for that. Cindy, if I may, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. Um, can you talk to me just a little bit about phone services versus in-person services. And the reason I bring that up is I truly believe that COVID has taught us a lesson that we don't necessarily have to travel the way we perhaps traveled a year ago or two years ago. Um, how the phone service is working out for you, because I know you're utilizing it, versus if you had your druthers, if you would, to have your in-person services? It makes an assessment very difficult okay. because you don't have the ability to look at that person. Very often an assessor will pay attention to when a person gets up to walk across the room and see what their actual disability is. How much help do they need getting out of the chair? How much help do they need to get across the room? Does it look like maybe they need some housekeeping services? Does it look like their refrigerator is empty? All of those things that you can't see through the phone, very challenging. The other thing is, is just the accuracy. People that know what services they need to be dependent in in order to qualify also know what answers they need to give us, and we don't have any way to verify that when we're doing it over the phone, so we have to take that word of the person as this is their dependency. So it really affects the accuracy of the assessment. And I think it affects probably in the senior population, those seniors that will say, oh, I do that myself, I do that myself. Well, clearly if you're in a home that is um, in shambles, they, they don't do housekeeping or they do need some support with that. 
we also get the ability to walk into a bathroom and look and say, oh, you'd really benefit from some grab bars in here or a high-rise toilet seat or all those things that we can eyeball and make suggestions for safety to ensure that people can stay in their home longer. So it's definitely a roadblock when we have to do it over the phone. So truly, there are advantages, and I've seen them um, over the phone, over a computer screen, but there are definitely disadvantages at the same time, and you're looking forward to getting back in the, in the home, if you will, to, to do those. The other, th the other thing is, is that it's really hard to establish an ongoing relationship with that client when you're on the phone. When you sit down in their living room and they offer you a cup of coffee or you, you relax in their home and they get to know you as a person, that is a big part of the assessment is, is building trust so that they will tell you what their needs are. They will tell you what's happening in their life. I would bet we probably don't catch some of the uh, adult protection or child protection issues because we're not seeing things face to face. You can't identify someone who's being uh, abused or harmed when you're not seeing them. I think clear. it's especially hard for the new assessments. You know, the reassessments usually it's the same assessor every year that assesses, so they know these people. The new, they they don't have. You know, so I think my assessor is saying it's taking longer over the phone, which they didn't expect okay. because they're compensating with extra questions and trying sure. to get at that when they used to be able to observe it. Thank you. Very mm -hmm. good. Thank right. you very much. So, so along those same lines, I, I thought that was a great question, uh, Commissioner Jelinski, and, and along those same lines. Um, so are you prohibited then by actions of the state um, from doing those assessments in person because of COVID? Or do you, have the, do you still have the opportunity to do them in person if you have the, let's say, the blessing of that individual mm -hmm. that they're comfortable with you coming to their house and you're comfortable with going there because of the whole COVID situation. Yeah, we, we can go into the home as long as we get permission and, and the assessor is comfortable and the client's comfortable and we d have done some that way just because it's some you have to. You know, some they've come into the office and we've done, you know, this sort of thing and some they went and did outside visits when possible, but we have done some in person, yes. Super. And just to also say, we still are looking for flexibility with the waivers, as I mentioned to Representative Senator. Um, because there are opportunities there, given the flexibility of telehealth or telephonic uh, means, but there are also some areas where still that person-to-person, face-to-face contact is critical. Um, so just looking for the state to give us the flexibility to make those good calls when it comes to the work we do with clients. I think at the end of the day, we'll come out with a, probably a hybrid um, which the business world is already talking about. There'll be far less business travel. I could see them saying perhaps people that are a reassessment that we already have established might be every other year you could do telephonically versus face-to-face. -face. I could see something like that coming out of this um, just because we've learned that, yes, we can do it, but it isn't ideal. Thank you. Thank you. And if I may, that's it for the reports, but I just want to give a brief update on COVID, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, it's not, it's been a challenging couple of weeks here in Morrison County. Um, our total cases is 3,527, with 180 of those in the last 14 days for a case rate of 54.38. We are averaging about 15 to 20 cases per day, which is concerning. Uh, before we were in the single digits and actually at a day of zero. Um, 44 of those are uh, students, uh, ages 5 to 18. So schools are seeing more of an issue with COVID right now. We've had about 10 people in the hospital, and hospitals are seeing a bit of an increase now. We've had three deaths in Morrison County uh, in the month of March. We've seen a little uptick in our long-term care um, cases as well, those in long-term care that are, are testing positive. However, we've seen that those that have been vaccinated have really, uh, the symptoms have been really reduced. And so I think they've seen the benefits of vaccinations in long-term care. And again, I just want to re remind folks that if you get a vaccine, it doesn't mean you are not going to get COVID. There is still that risk of getting COVID, but your chances of dying or being significantly ill are reduced uh, tremendously. So, um, so again, we're seeing an uptick. It is concerning. We've 
uh, had communication from MDH that they may be looking at some of our samples and seeing if we might have a variant in the area. Um, we've not heard back. They said it'd take a couple weeks before they would know whether or not we've had a variant here in Morrison County. So we know down in Carver, Anoka, and I think Scott County have seen some variant outbreaks. So, um, so we've seen an uptick and it is, it has been concerning. So hoping people will uh, wear masks, stay socially distanced and get a vaccine because there is opportunity to get a vaccine, so. Sounds good, thanks Brad for the update. So, thank you, that's all thank, I have. Thank, thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you. thank you. Okay, next land service, Amy. Good morning, Amy. Good morning. And Jean. Good morning, Jean. Good morning. Well, it's that time of year again where our valuation notices are going to go out. And so we uh, just wanted to <laughs> update you on where property values are at. So when those uh, arrive in everyone's mailbox, you have a general idea of what's going on from from that standpoint. So I've got Jean to brief you on that and then also um, a state assessed property settlement that we just want to make you aware of. So hit it, Jean. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Jean. <laughs> The valuation notices for the 2021 assessment payable in 22 will be sent out on or before uh, March 30th. So um, we will be receiving phone calls sometimes after that. Mm -hmm. um, values continue to increase due to the strong sales in Morrison County. Um, and when I'm speaking of this, due to specific <coughs> changes in individual properties, the information that I give you is really an estimate of the overall um, in a township or city um, because there could be some new construction going on. There could be, you know, things that have changed in individual properties. So I can't, you know, it's hard to do real specific. Um, so the residential property um, is going to increase anywhere from zero to 15%. Um, in townships, the townships and cities that increased a little bit high on the higher end um, is Bellevue, Darling, Green Prairie, and that would be on water. Morrow, Richardson, uh, Scandia Valley, Lake Alec, and Fish Trap have increased substantially. Um, townships and cities that's seen a slight decrease uh, are Two Rivers, uh, Motley City, and uh, Scandia Valley, Lake Shamina, and Crookneck. Um, Agricultural um, productive land has seen a five to 10% e increase and rural vacant land is anywhere from five to 20% increase. Um, we, were, we were significantly low in those areas. Um, values are just, uh, the sales in those areas are going very strong. And um, townships and cities that seen an increase on the higher end of that Agricultural and rural vacant land are Scandia Valley, Richardson, Lee, um, Pierce Township, Swanville Township, Lakin, Elmdale Township, and Two Rivers. Industrial property and apartments will see about a 5% increase. And if you have any questions on individual properties or on um, areas, your, your specific areas, you can always contact me um, and, and we can review a little bit more details. Mr. Chair? Go ahead, Amy. I believe last year we emailed something out to each of you so you knew what was going on in in the in your district by township and city. And so we will get that out to you as well. So then you just have that in front of you. So if you get a call from someone you'll have a general idea of what's going on in those areas. Does anybody have any questions? Maybe one? Sure. Um, so when we look at uh, the county as a whole, the um, uh, the estimated evaluation of the property in Morrison County would have increased um, um, this year that we're talking about to previous year by five percent, seven percent, or. So when I, when I look at sales, all the sales come through our office and we take a look at those and make sure that those are all good sales. 
Once that's determined, then I look at, well, they, they, they're sent down to the Department of Revenue, um, and so they oversee. So there's things that the Department of Revenue, they put on time trends, they put on um, sometimes financial um, fees that, are, that, that try to equalize that value. So I will look at specific areas. So it could be, I look at all townships and all cities. Obviously, we need six sales in order to, to move on on increasing or decrease or a five-year history. So some, some cities, some, some of our smaller cities are not going to get six sales, but we'll look at that five-year history. So they're going to be in township or city, specifically. Some of our bigger areas like Richardson, um, Scandia Valley, I will look at like the lake areas um, individually and then put them together as a whole and make sure that I'm, I'm meeting the criteria that we need to be in. Okay. Commissioner Wincher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gene, when someone sells property, you yep. know, of acre lot, five acre lot in the city or whatever, and they're building their own house, and again, lumber is skyrocketing right exactly. now. Exactly. Is that cause also, so when you, if I pay X amount of dollars for the land, how do you use one go in there and say, okay, now I'm building a house and it's gonna cost, so do you wait like a year or two, or how does that? Uh... Um, when the, when the, the land has the same, is gonna have the same value of similar properties. So if it's something, maybe it's split off from a farmland, um, it will get its own individual land value. Um, the house will then be graded as far as quality and construction, um, and it will be measured and story heights, and there's things that will contribute to the value. And then once that's been established, because that's established the same way throughout the county, then those adjustments will be placed on there due to where it's located. So it has nothing to do with if uh, I could have, and again, I know somebody had a, Estimate on material was a hundred and some thousand last year. It's a hundred and thirty some thousand this year. So right. do you take that into cons when that house is being built? Hey, you, you know this is why we're assessing you high because the lumber is so high. Well, and that we go by sales. So the first the first thing that we do is we start at a base rate of, of a square footage of a house. Um, that's probably where that would that would fall into is because those those are. Um, those are higher now than they have been in the past. Um, but what we really look at is the sales. So when you have, um, when you have property that are, you want to build a, a house that's going to be worth you know, 300,000, but now it's going to cost you 400,000, so you decide maybe I'm going to buy instead. So you have this larger amount of money that you can now spend. So that's going to put some of those houses that are currently being, that are currently being built to get a little bit more money for because it's still more economical than building. So right. not only does that, co that cost in square footage, but it also costs in what people will purchase a little bit higher for um, properties that, that are already built. Thank you. <clears throat> Gene, my understanding though, just because the property values go up, that doesn't mean the taxes are going up, right? Because it's Absolutely, yeah. Be because it's based on what we spend mm -hmm. divided amongst all the property owners in whatever percentage they have. Correctly. And Correct. any other special assessments that might be made right. on the property. Right. Because so. property is selling for a lot of money. That's just the way it is. It is. And uh, we've been looking at sales. Um, so we've completed this. And um, we, now we're working on sales for the upcoming next year one. And... And we're still, still low, even with the values that we've increased. Um, it'll be a little bit harder um, to get that uh, um, percentage per township and city. Um, we've been doing a little bit more countywide as far as story heights. Um, sometimes, you know, our rates on two stories versus one stories versus slab homes. Those are all changing. Um, and so you might have a house that goes up. 20%, 25%, even though the overall went up 15, just because some of those changes have been made. Um, and that's trying to get to those rates that we need for the sales that are taking place. Okay, thank Mr. You. Chair, mm -hmm. I just want to say, too, over this last year, Jean has spent an awful lot of time uh, reviewing all of the 
hundreds and hundreds of codes that we have that we can assign to properties and has really streamlined that. And what that's done is she's gotten all of the uh, field assessors on the same page as far as um, being consistent about how they're classifying these properties, how they're valuing them. And so that has been a, a really, that's been a lot of work <laughs> and it's taken a lot of time but it is definitely worth it um, because it has really uh, um, minimized the number of the plethora of codes that we had in there that weren't necessary. So I just wanted to make sure that you know what's happening on an everyday basis that Gina really, has really dug into those and is biting off each of those pieces and, and making that uh, a lot more um, consistent amongst our, our staff, which is really important. Thank you. I do have one more update. Um, Center Point Energy had appealed to the Department of Revenue um, their valuation for state assessed property um, for the 2017 um, taxes. The tax court is issued um, and Morrison County, uh, this, does go, this does go through an abatement process, but it's not something that you have to vote on because it is a court court case and it has been already determined. Um, just, just, we have about 20 properties of Center Point Energy and um, so the previous 2017 taxes that they paid in were $337,382. The new, um, the new payment would be two, 261372 which is a reduction of $76,010. Um, that would be a tax reduction. And then there is, I believe there is an interest rate that is applied to that number um, before it's sent out. Gene, if I'm not mistaken, that, they did that last year too, yes, right? they did. They went to yeah. court, so this will probably be ongoing every year. They'll probably I go to court. I believe they've appealed several years. So, yeah, and I, wasn't it like over a hundred thousand last year? It was. It was. They're they're large numbers. Yeah. Yep. 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 And this is this is just the Morrison County one. I mean, this has been this is throughout all of throughout Minnesota. The state, so. Yep. So. Sounds good. Anybody got any questions? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay, next extension report. Are they online? They're right here. Well, we got. Oh, back there, <laughs> hiding behind Steve. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Samantha, good morning. All right, I just have a quick update. Um, so I'm still working from home. Primarily, the university wants us to work from home for, I think, as a precaution until about summertime. I'm doing a lot more, you know, adapting or programming to an online platform. I'm still able to reach and partner with a lot of agencies around Morrison County and I have actually been able to expand in more of a statewide, statewide reach. One being with our Start Strong Child Care Provider Training. Um, we've just wrapped up our second training, round of training. First was in November, second one starting in January. And we are going to be starting a third one in May. So we, we promote it, you know, statewide and we get um, child care agencies all across central Minnesota. I primarily promote it to the county licensor in Morrison County, and that is Sourceful, and she covers Todd, Morrison, Bodina, and I think Cass yes. is the four counties they cover. So she sends it out to all the child care providers in that area. So we get most of our providers in that kind of pool around central Minnesota. We've gotten actually a lot of great feedback from this online training, so we've I'm working with another small group to turn some of our other, what we call partner education, so training other organizations to, you know, um, offer some certain programming and, you know, trainings for, you know, continuing education. One is, um, it's called Let's Cook and Eat Healthy. This one is for kind of adult, like, care facilities. Um, the one I can think of in Morrison County is Horizon Health kind of like that kind of program. We do some continuing education with them. We've done it in person in the past, 
but with the great feedback from the Start Strong Child Care one, we're working on adapting this one to an online platform, and we'll hopefully have that one ready by May, maybe even early June. I'm still able to partner with my schools. I've done seven Go Wild classroom classes, um, in, again, this online platform. And even working on, you know, doing some other education, you know, we're calling them the Flyer Friendly Fitness Calendars. So we create a calendar and each day has a different sort of physical activity to, to promote physical activity and with some nutrition and overall wellness tips and then healthy recipes on the back and that gets sent out to the students. We started it when they were full distance learning but we're just kind of keeping it going throughout the end of the year. And then a weekly, what we're calling flyer friendly weekly wellness tips. So I record myself, you know, giving a two, one two minute kind of nutrition tip. This month, March, was National Nutrition Month, so I kept it very just basic and just did overall my plate guidelines and fun tips for them. And I could send out to the schools and put in their morning announcements. So I'll do a nutrition tip one week. Um, SHIP does a wellness tip. I think the FIA teacher does a fitness tip. So the, each week is a different sort of wellness topic. Uh, another partnership I've recently started, um, the Little Falls Farmers Market is looking to set up an EBT machine at their market this summer, so I'm helping them with that process. In addition to that, we're hoping to get Pop Club set up at their market this summer. This um, program helps kind of promote the farmers market to youth. So what they get, if any youth that shows up gets a $2 token to buy any sort of fruit or vegetable that they want at the farmers market. We hope to, you know, COVID you know, restrictions pending, do some activities and maybe one or two food demos to kind of help promote this program and also the EBT machine at the farmer's market and maybe a few market tours this summer as well. Uh, these are all vague you know, plans just because we're not really sure what COVID's gonna look like come June and July. So those are some things, you know, if we don't get them fully implemented this summer, they will be for sure next summer as well. Good, thank you. That sounds like a great program. Yeah. Get kids involved and, yeah. I yeah, because like I mean the EVT machine is for, you know, use those to use their SNAP benefits at the farmer's market so they can swipe their card, mm -hmm. they get tokens and they can do their shopping. Um, we, depending on how well that turns out, we could apply for market books, which is a, statewide program that matches up to $10. So if a person were to say swipe the card and take up $10, state would match, I think it's, yeah, I think it's state funded, would match that $10. So they would technically get $20 to spend at the farmer's market. This is, you know, to help promote local foods and also, you know, healthier eating. So the pop club would kind of tails off of that, but it just, you know, is just focused on youth, getting them, you know, at the market, eating more fruits and vegetables, and even maybe familiar with some of the local growers in the Little Falls area. Fantastic. Thank you, Does Any questions? Any questions? If not, we thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for your time. Thanks for the presentation. Yes. Auditor's report. Help your smiling, Chelsea. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Chelsea. I have a resolution before you. This resolution is requesting the approval for the Morrison County Pheasants Forever to hold a <laughs> raffle on September 7th of this year at the Little Falls Ballroom. Could I get a motion on that? So moved, Mr. Chair. Got a motion by Commissioner Blaine, seconded by? Second. Commissioner Jelinski, any further discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. And next on the agenda, I have a request to pay all the bills. Could I get a motion to pay Mr. the Mr. Chair, ones? I'll make a motion to pay all the bills. Okay, we got a motion by Commissioner Jelinski, seconded by? Second. Commissioner Wincher, any further discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Or roll call, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Lemire. Aye. Commissioner Wincher. Aye. Commissioner Jelinski. Aye. Commissioner Blaine. Aye. And I. Motion carries. Mr. Chair, if I could just add, 
um, onto the land services report um, as their valuation notices go out, so will the property tax statements. So those two go together. And again, they'll be out by March 31st of this month. So just wanted to give an update on that. And then as far as the state court order, the abatement, there is a statute that we do have to pay interest on. So that will be going along with the $76,010. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I just want to note, sending those out together hasn't been something we've always done, and I appreciate the effort to still do that because it saves a lot of money when it comes to those mailings. So it's a good example of working across department lines up there that continues that I, it's very appreciated because it really does help in terms of that cost and keep it within a reasonable level. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Public Works, Steve. Welcome. Thanks, Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Morning, Morning again, Steve. Morning. I have a number of your of RBAs for your consideration. All of our work for the for the summer. So I will I wanted to start off with the status of our transportation improvement plan, which you previously approved for us to move forward and work through approvals and all the necessary documentation in order to go to bid. So just to, to cover those quickly, the, the replacement of the bridge uh, just north of Randall is currently being advertised and we're looking for, uh, we're, we have a bid date of 4821. Uh, County State at Highway 9, just south of Uppsala, is a is a Stearns County line road with us that we have an agreement with them. We handle the maintenance on on uh, County State at Highway 9, and Stearns County handles the construction. And so that is, they have quite a large contract down there that uh, they've tied this to, and we will pay our portion of County State at Highway 9 prorated based on. Um, the mileage that is under our jurisdiction. So that's moving forward. Um, on County State 8 Highway 15, that is our, the highway between the city of Swanville and the city of Uppsala. We have a number of uh, culvert replacements and tapers going in, preparing that for next year's uh, pavement preservation project and it, that will be under consideration here as we move through the RBAs today. County State Aid Highway 21, we show two projects. One is the, the mill tight paven overlay, the, um, it, which is essentially our, our pavement preservation portion of that. Along with that, we have a federal project, the paved shoulder, ground in sinusoidal edge line that we tied together with that. That will be uh, presented for your consideration to award after we opened bids uh, last week. We have a number of uh, projects that we tied together which were county state aid highways. And when we tie federal projects together, we get into a substantially a larger amount of documentation and approvals that we go through. So 21, we keep those separately because if you tie projects that don't have federal money, to a letting that has federal money, it federalizes all of the projects and you have to go through the process on all of them. Uh, that's why you see that we don't, we don't have one big contract, we have a number of contracts that we've done. Um, 24, which is from Stearns County line past Bolus to Trunk Highway 238, uh, is one for your consideration, CASA 26, which runs from uh, 24, going to the east, uh, the city of Royalton um, is included in a contract. Our uh, 103, 247, and 248 are county roads, small volumes of uh, quantities, I should say, uh, near the city of Hillman. So those were also included in uh, that contract, um, mainly because it, they it, those are, uh, 103 makes it a municipal state aid project, and that's through the small town of Hillman. 247, 248, when we have those three digit numbers, uh, beginning with two, those are local roads, county roads. The only funding that we have is levy for those. Um, there might be one here and there where we've been successful getting federal money, but obviously no state money can be spent on those. So we have all of these 
uh, moving forward, the forty, the forty-three that you say moved to, that I show moved to twenty-two. I was forced to move that little piece to twenty-two for the reason I stated that uh, if we tied it to the Piers project, since uh, there's safe routes to school money, which is federal money, it would federalize that piece. And it didn't make it worthwhile to do, and we have uh, we have work that that it fits good with for 2022. So we weren't we didn't tie, we didn't tie it to the to the project in the city of Piers, which is coming up. Uh, we will be opening bids on Thursday for that project. But everything else is um, moving forward on track. We have the Mississippi Trail uh, Bridge abutment repairs that's out for bid. And then also a project that is a uh, project we're doing uh, for Elmdale and Two Rivers Township, which we've tied to the bridge replacement just outside of Randall. And those um, will be uh, will be opening in April, the eighth of April. So there's been a lot of work going on getting these prepared and taking them to bid, and now we have for your consideration. The proposals that the contractors have made have included the abstract of bids, so you can uh, review how the contractors have bid these projects. So the first uh, contract that we are requesting your authorization on is contract 297, and that is the, the projects out by Hillman, which is County Road 247, County Road 248, and the, the, the 703 is uh, that small piece of municipal state aid that runs in the city of Hillman. Along with that, we have tied the culvert replacements of County State Aid Highway 15 between Swanville and Uppsala. And we have included County State Aid Highway 24 running from Stearns County Line through Bolus to Trunk Highway 238, and County State Aid Highway 26 running from our Casa 24 to the city of Royalton. We received four bids. Make sure they're all in here. <clears throat> Anderson Brothers, Central Specialties, Dunnicks, and Knife River. And the lowest responsible bid after receiving those, and they have been thoroughly reviewed and evaluated and checked. And the uh, bid of Knife River is the lowest responsible bid received at $1,935,958. So our request is that the board would authorize this resolution and award this contract to Knife River. Could I get a motion on that? So moved, Mr. Chair. Got a motion by Commissioner Blaine, seconded by? Second. Commissioner Wincher, any further discussion? Not, this is roll call, Commissioner Wincher? Aye. Commissioner Jelinski? Aye. Commissioner Blaine? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Commissioner Lemire? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, the next request for board action is consideration of contract 296 which is our county state aid highway 21. There are two, two project numbers involved. One is our SAP, which is the pavement preservation portion of CASA 21. The other one is SP uh, 049-070-024, which is the highway safety improvement part of that contract. So what that HIST money does is it covers the pavement, uh, paving of the shoulder and it also then covers the, the, mumbles, the mumble strips and the, the striping that goes along uh, for the high visibility uh, edge line that we put in place and have over a substantial number of miles in our county. Um, this is a, is a roadway that is, we've been having a lot of work that we've done to hold it together. It's uh, 20 plus years old and uh, so the pavement preservation portion of this project is, is, is very much needed. We had, again, four bidders that uh, submitted proposals. And the lowest responsible bidder 
was Knife River Corporation in the amount of $2,114,595.11. You will see that we are asking that the board authorize this contract under the contingency that we receive final approval from MnDOT's Office of Civil Rights. Since this has federal money on it, there is a disadvantaged business enterprise goal on it. That has to go through a review at the state, and it takes a little bit of time since we opened on Thursday. We haven't received approval from them yet. Everything was in order for the proposal that we received, and don't, I don't expect that we'll have any issue. But in making the award board, I would ask that you make it contingent on that coming through before we would send out any contracts or bonds to the contract. Mr. Chair, I'll make that motion with the contingency. Got a motion by Commissioner Wincher, seconded by Commissioner Blaine. Any further discussion? Not this is roll call. Commissioner Jelinski. Aye. Commissioner Blaine. Aye. And aye. Commissioner Lemire. Aye. Commissioner Wincher. Aye. Motion carries. Mr. Chair, can I ask a quick question? Is this part of that Com uh, that policy that Beth did for you when it comes to federal dollars, or is that a different yeah. type of program? Yes. Okay. Uh, we th those issues are a part of receiving a subrecipient. Any yeah. any federal money that the county reads receives is a subrecipient of the state, mm -hmm. and so those civil rights issues are all a part of of that. I don't know if you guys realize that. That was something that we had worked on recently and I think might become more of an issue as more of these federal dollars come in for like the, oh, the various COVID responses. Um, similar to what we had to do when we transitioned from merit and all of the policy development that we had to do and make sure that they met certain standards. The same thing happened in a recent turnaround. Beth ended up developing it and it was it was fantastic work in terms of getting what you needed to be able to accept those federal dollars for road programs. It's all transitioning. The requirements that are put upon the different components of our work when it comes to meeting federal civil rights or ADA compliance, we have to have policies developed for almost, almost each of those areas. And so the response may be um, requiring a lot of additional work when it comes to being able to respond to those needs and in a quick manner when it when they develop these rules, because there's a lot of things coming federal um, from federal legislation that are changing how we need to um, develop those kind of almost HR-related policies. And so this was one example that all of a sudden quick this summer, Beth, uh, Steve had indicated, you know, geez, I need, I need this work done. Where do I go? And so Beth took that on and the quick matter um, returned it with an acceptable um, product that you were able to get through what you needed to get through. It was all very new. Yes, I think... Under the new administration, obviously, there is, uh, there is a greater focus on, on some of these issues. Mm -hmm. So um, that's all happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was just curious because it, it was a lot. M Mr. Chairman, members of the board, the next uh, request for board action is uh, for contract 298, which is County State 8 Highway 34. It is a completion of really the work that we began last year in which we re, uh, resurfaced uh, from US Highway 10 through the city of Buckman. We're picking up from the end of that project and we are going to the east to its intersection at Gutwalls Corner of the County State 8 Highway 34. And this also, last year, was a federal project that was uh, um, similar to this. This is, again, two projects that include uh, pavement preservation and the Highway Safety Improvement Program project. We received four bids, five bids. Anderson Brothers, Central, Dunnick, Knife River, and this time we had Mark Sand and Gravel. Again, Knife River Corporation was the apparent low bidder, lowest responsible bidder, at $1,719,634.34. It's our recommendation that the board would award this, again, contingent upon uh, approval by the Minnesota Office of Civil Rights. Mr. Chair, I'll move on that as explained. We've got a motion by Commissioner Jelinski, seconded by... Second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Lemire. 
Any further discussion? If none, roll call. Commissioner Blaine? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Lemire? Aye. Uh, Wincher? Aye. And Jelinski? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, then finally, is um, our 2021 pavement marking contract 2102. Uh, this is uh, various roads throughout the county for restriping as a part of the, the uh, maintenance monies that we receive from the state. We have an obligation to maintain our pavement markings in, and their retro reflectivity in, in um, decent condition. And we have a program that we are on on which roads um, and how often they are restriped. We went to bid and received four proposals for our maintenance work for 2021. And the uh, lowest responsible bid received was from Sir Lines a lot in the amount of $221,474.80. Um, and we've used these. They've had a number of projects with us before. They do good work. It's our recommendation that you would award this contract to Sir Lines a lot in that amount. Okay, could I get a motion on that? So moved. Motion by Commissioner Wincher, seconded by? Second. Commissioner Jelinski, any further discussion? Now roll call, I'll say aye. Commissioner Lemire? Aye. Commissioner Wincher? Aye. Commissioner Jelinski? Aye. And Commissioner Blaine? Aye. Motion carries. Well, yeah, Mr. Thanks, Chairman. Steve. That's Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Steve. you very much, Steve. Okay, next we'll move on to administrator's report. Okay. Mr. Chair, as you guys have been aware, I've had to do, um, and we have run a, okay. <laughs> uh, a program um, for business relief grants um, or support grants for dollars that we received from legislation that was recently enacted. And so um, I did that and ran that program, and I got a lot of good feedback. I hope you guys did also. Um, but we did have kind of an interesting um, development, one being a grant recipient she indicated that she worked with her accountant and looked at their numbers and realized that she wasn't comfortable accepting that because things weren't as bad as what she had thought um, when she originally applied. And so that was being returned. I mean, in the same week, it was I think the next day, um, I was working in the evening with a, an owner of of an establishment that had asked where their where their payment was and was kind of confused because she had thought her her accountant had submitted that application. And after some digging and some work with, with them, realized that due to a clerical error, their application didn't get in. And so um, it was very easy to determine it was intended to be submitted and also very easy to determine based on their information which level they would qualify for, which would have been that $13,000 um, Executive Order 99 level that didn't receive direct Department of Revenue funding. And so, um, Oddly enough, that's the same amount that was returned. And so my request to you is to accept that returned grant and then to reissue to that um, clearly uh, clerical error um, mistake that, that caused that application to not come in. Um, it happens to work out. It's kind of crazy sometimes how things do work. Uh, so that would be my request. Can we get a motion on that? So moved. Second. Okay, we got a motion by Commissioner Jelinski, seconded by Commissioner Wincher. Any further discussion? Not all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, Mr. Chair, if you want Steve to come in, I, we can do that, but the, the approval for the final payment for Heartland Glass, as you recall, we've been kind of knocking these off the list once Contegrity gets us the final payment um, uh, tallies or the, the, the paperwork's all done, this would be an issue um, for Heartland Glass for the project. And I need um, roll call for that if, if you're willing. Do, uh, can I get a motion on that? Uh, I'll move on. Got that, a motion Mr. by Commissioner Blaine, seconded by Commissioner Lemire. Any further discussion? This will be roll call. Commissioner Lemire. Aye. Commissioner Wincher. Aye. Commissioner Jelinski. Aye. Commissioner Blaine. Aye. And I. Motion carries. Um, then I just need to let you know we'll be working on figuring out how to get um, a way to have one more action item here. That's the support letter um, for the Historical Society. They are working to try to get support 
um, for their HVAC system. If you guys recall, we've, we've talked to them about that before, about their capital oh, yeah. plan to be able to get a new HVAC. And so they are looking to um, try to get some legislative support with that. And so they were requesting support or a letter of support from this board. And so I was hoping to have the chair be able to sign that. And typically we bring that then to the board for um, affirmation that that's all right. Could I get a motion to accept that letter? I'll move on it, Mr. Chair. motion by Commissioner Jelinski, seconded by? Second. Commissioner Lemire, any further discussion? If not, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. All right, Mr. Chair. And then as far as the office goes, we're continuing to work through um, transition um, when it comes to getting payroll done. Um, I do have a number of calls scheduled for the the. $1.9 trillion or the six and a half million that'll be coming to Morrison County as far as detail on that. Um, there are a number of calls each week that that are appropriate to participate in if we're able to um, when it comes to prioritizing that. But it's it'll be interesting to see what happens. I'm hoping we get a couple of years um, as indicated and I'm hoping there's some flexibility with that. Um, but it's, it's going to be a lot in the next short while as that kind of gets developed. Um, but other than that, it'll be kind of bare minimum when it comes to dealing with anything extra just so we can get the, the required work done, which is most of what it is we do when it comes to legislative or um, statute requirements. So just wanted to let you know we did work with the departments and let them know that it'll be, um, it'll be something that we'll do our best Thank at. Thank you very much. Okay, next we'll have committee reports and upcoming schedule. What are we looking at for dates? March 28th to April 10th. March 28th to April 10th. Commissioner Jelinski, would you mind starting us out? I will. Starting on the 29th at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I've got a Central Minnesota Regional Strategic Planning Committee meeting. That should be 3 of 3. On the 30th at 8.30 in the morning, we've got a planning meeting here at the Government Center. And from 1 to 4 that same afternoon, we have a Planning Commission Board of Adjustment DNR variances in Shoreland. I think that's here in this room. On the 31st at 11 o'clock in the morning, we've got a Central Minnesota Emergency Services Board Executive Committee meeting, followed at 1 o'clock by the same Central Minnesota Emergency Services full board. On April 1st at 10 o'clock in the morning, I have a State Emergency Communications Board meeting. It's a legislative conference committee and legislative committee, it's conference call, it's all online. On the 2nd of April at 8.30 in the morning, we have a public works planning meeting at Public Works. On the 6th at 9 o'clock in the morning, we have a county board meeting. On the 9th at 10 o'clock in the morning, there's a Central Minnesota Emergency Services Board RAC meeting that is also live via web stuff here. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Blaine. Um, you got public works? I have public works. Yeah, I uh, believe I'm good to go. What was the starting date on that again? Which you wanted us for our calendar? March 28th. March 28th. Okay, Board of Adjustments, TSWAC. I look like I'm covered. Commissioner Lemire? The 29th, HRA, 9 o'clock at, at HRA. And that's it. Commissioner Wincher. You have me covered, but Mr. Chair, I have one other comment. Or, I had two letters from people that we uh, issued uh, COVID money or whatever for. There's really nothing that we can do because they didn't. They appreciated the money, but they wanted to see why we didn't give them more. And I, I responded in one way, but I don't know. There's nothing really we could do and say, okay, you know, we'll get, we got another thousand dollars. They didn't even ask for any additional money. They just said, well, why didn't I get more? And I kind of respond in my own way, but I don't know if there's any other way to say something. I don't know if any of you guys had anybody call um, on that. 
can't give more than what we got. <laughs> exactly. No, and, right. and, and I did have a number of calls with questions, and I kind of said the same thing. You know, it's a difficult choice. We had $3.6 million in request, and we had $650,000 to, to divvy up. Um, I, I let them know certainly tough decisions needed to be made. I, I, we tried to apply reasonable standards. The legislation that was authorized, I, I kept going back to that in terms of it really – the legislation that was authorized really responded to EO 99, if you recall. And so that's why you prioritized that as a board in terms of making sure you look at that. Um, however, we did expand it past that to the best of the ability with the limited funds that we had. Um, I, I think critical sector, some of those that were, uh, were applying that didn't qualify were those, those that we excluded due to the legislation that authorized it. So... Um, while reasonable people disagree, I think it makes sense that you, you did what you could with the limited dollars that you had. Um, I did let people know, certainly keep an eye out, um, who knows what this additional federal dollars will do. Um, if the federal dollars could come with, that's why I mentioned to Senator Gazelka too, could come with more restrictions, so we'll see how that goes and more work. I mean, the, the amount of, of input and work we did this summer when dealing with the CARES, the Federal CARES Act, was far different than what I did um, for the business, the second round of business grants that we got from the state of Minnesota because of that flexibility that we had. Um, so depending upon what comes down with that, whether it's going to be um, private grant kind of components or whether it's not more infrastructure, I don't know how that'll look yet, but keeping them aware of additional opportunities out there is, is what's most important. But I, I really think you guys did a very fair and reasonable job given the parameters you had to work with, um, but certainly those that maybe weren't on the receiving end may feel different. I don't know if you said that or not, but didn't you also kind of look at what funding they had in the past and try to balance right. things out a little bit? Well, so. we certainly asked for that, um, yeah. and I think it played a part in what it was that you guys took into consideration for ultimate levels, but... Um, you know, everybody has, each program is meant to fund different businesses or different institutions. So um, not every program is meant for every situation. And so that was another conversation I had with a number of folks also. If there's anybody you want me to call, want to have me call back or anything, Commissioner Winter, I'm more than happy to. I just thought maybe like our, our chair had a little extra money in his pocket or something. Well, it takes three of you to decide what it is you want to do, but that wasn't the direction I got. <laughs> so we just funded, distributed what we had. I thank you. Is there anything else? Not going to get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Winter, seconded by? Blaine. Commissioner Blaine. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much.